Minnesota's first black female sheriff. Here's NBC's Blaine Alexander with more. Inside the Hennepin County Jail, Nate Johnson's free riders class has a special guest. This isn't the end of the line for you. Sheriff Dewana Witt. A few weeks on the job, it's not unusual to see her here, but what might surprise you is what she says. I was that person who was afraid of the police, saw my brother's butt get kicked many times by the police. It's why she says she never expected to find herself in a uniform. What led you to law enforcement? You know, I used to tell people it was an accident. I do tell people this is my purpose. Cindy? If there is a conventional path to law enforcement, Sheriff Witt is far from it. Growing up in South Minneapolis with her four siblings, drugs and violence were always nearby. By age 15, Dewana was a mother. I saw myself as a statistic. As a teenage mother? Um, as a teenage mother, as someone growing up in poverty. My mother had a drug addiction. My father was an alcoholic. And with that environment came a very early mistrust of police. A man was shot. He was shot by the police, actually. And I could have been all of four or five years old. But 24 years ago, something changed when Sheriff Witt, then working for a nonprofit, happened to take a tour of the jail. At the end of that tour, they talked about how they needed women in the field and women of color. She applied on a whim and got hired as a detention deputy. That's when her views started to shift. I started having more encounters with law enforcement, men and women, and getting to know them as individuals. You know, my barriers that I had, they were falling. Over the next two decades, she worked her way up through the ranks. Then, in January, according to the law and the best of my ability, Sheriff Dewana Witt became the first woman to lead her department and the first black female sheriff in the state of Minnesota, a milestone that's all the more meaningful when you consider where she is. Black Hennepin County, the very county where George Floyd was killed. The street where he died was just a block away from the community center where Sheriff Witt grew up. You watched that video along with the rest of the world. Yes. The big difference, of course, is that you were watching it happen in your own community. That was probably one of the most difficult times of my entire life. It ruined a lot of things that had been done to make this profession better and to bridge the gap within communities. She says the hits came from all sides. People would look at me as a black woman, as a black person in a uniform, like, what are you doing? You know, being called names from traitors to Auntie Tammy instead of Uncle Tom. These were fellow black people that yeah, would look yeah. at you and wonder why you were in law enforcement. Yeah, it's like, you know, you're on the wrong side. And that's, I'm sorry, I can never say, talk about this without getting a little choked up. Yeah. But if people would have just known the story of like what it takes to do this job as a black person and to have people say those things to you, it was, it was hurtful. Despite it all, she says she never thought about leaving the job. I knew that I needed to be a person who could interpret, if you will, what people were seeing, because everybody couldn't understand that. For Sheriff Witt, then a major, that meant talking to people, protesters, face to face, even when other officers warned her not to, a step toward building trust. That we had a sense of safety and security. Last November, one of her very first visits after winning the election was the jail. And as she walked among the inmates, Sheriff Witt got a big surprise. People were standing up and applauded me. When you and they're in. like, that's our sheriff, y'all. You know, I realized that I'm a symbol of hope for some people and a hope for change. So I got a lot to live up to, but I'm, I'm ready for it. Now to another trailblazer who's breaking barriers. Charlie Mitchell is the first black chef in New York City's history and only the second black chef in the country to earn a prestigious Michelin star. Craig Melvin stopped by his restaurant, Clover Hill in Brooklyn, to discuss his groundbreaking achievement. The chef behind this popular Brooklyn restaurant is now being celebrated for more than fine dining. Charlie Mitchell is the first black chef in New York City to be awarded a Michelin star and just the second black executive chef in the country to achieve that honor. I wanted to always, you know, plant my feet here and be a serious New York City chef, so that was always a goal of mine. And look at you now. Yeah. <laughs> Dreams come true. Yeah.
Mitchell was born and raised in Detroit and developed a passion for food and cooking from his grandmother. I think the thing that stuck with me the most is like she used to like this like whole fry fish, like whole fry bass all the time when I was younger, and I think that stood out the most. Head on? Always. Oh. <laughs> he attended culinary school for a few months, but preferred on-the-job training instead. I ended up like Googling restaurants in the metro area, got my first real job, and in that kitchen is where I was like, wow, like I love the way they work. I love how professional it is. Like I'm using ingredients I've never had, never learned about. Years of experience in world-class restaurants like 11 Madison Park eventually led him to this quiet street in Brooklyn Heights. When Clover Hill opened one year ago, he became its executive chef in charge of creating the menu. Mitchell's team plates an eight-course tasting menu that regularly changes with the best seasonal foods available. I guess it's challenging, but we're always changing something, or we're always trying to make the dish the best version of itself, right? So we may tweak it every day for two weeks straight if we have to, to get it to be like a perfect dish. That quest for perfection did not go unnoticed. When Michelin announced it starred restaurants in October, not only did Clover Hill earn a star in its first year, but Chef Mitchell picked up the award for Best Young Chef. That was a complete surprise when they announced that, and I was just humbled, you know? Were you aware at the time of the historic implications? I was not, not at the time. You always think so many people have come before you, you just assume that someone has already done this, you know? You just, this doesn't cross your mind that you may be the first or second to do really anything. Especially here in New York City. Why do you think that's the case? Why do you think there aren't more people who look like us as executive chefs in fine dining restaurants like this? You don't make a lot of money as a young cook, you know? So I think a lot of times we're like chasing a very different American dream than to kind of put up with these aggressive environments that are often led by people who don't look like us. I tasted some of the iconic dishes that earned this unique place in the food world. I'm going to come around and try this here, although it's almost too pretty, pretty to touch. <laughs> Including a shark fin flounder and a spicy tapioca. But this is nice, and it's subtle. And a Japanese mackerel. We dry age it, we hang it a little bit, and then we finish it in a little bit of beeswax so that it retains moisture. When people leave your restaurant, what, what do you want them to to take away. I want them to kind of be, you know, excited or inspired about food, you know? Like, that's something that is very important to us. Up next, Al Roker visits Sesame Street to meet the talented puppeteer blazing a trail on the iconic show. And later, meet the artist on a mission to bring more inclusivity to Hollywood. We'll be right back. We're back with Discover Black Heritage. My fellow Third Hour co-anchor Al Roker paid a visit to the set of Sesame Street and spoke with a woman making history as the show's first full-time black female puppeteer. As the song goes, can you tell me how to get to Sesame Street? 
we found out from their newest puppeteer, Megan Pyphus Peace, who's been blazing trails just like the show always has. Well, we're here sitting on the stoop at 123 Sesame Street. What are your early memories of, of this program? All of the characters here were my friends. I watched them every day. I had a personal connection with the street. When I was three years old, I had a Sesame Street birthday party. We had a Sesame Street cake and an Elmo walk around character came out and Big Bird. Those friends would help her find her passion. When I was 10 years old, I had just changed to a new elementary school and had to make new friends. I was super shy. I went to a puppetry conference with a few members from my church. I was exposed to women ventriloquists and I saw myself being able to open up just like them and uh, make something come alive in that moment. So I went home, I told my parents I wanted to become a ventriloquist. Megan's mom, checking out VHS tapes from the library for her daughter. And Megan watched them over and over, starting to mimic them. I took my puppets to school and was cracking jokes during lunch break. And my teachers noticed and asked if I would perform in front of the whole school. Mm -hmm. and that was my very first performance. And what made me knew in that moment that that's what I wanted to do forever, to hold the attention of kids anywhere from three years old to 12 and make them laugh and smile, that became my joy. That joy continuing as she performed, seeing an opportunity to express herself. So little, you don't go very far. Becoming known as the valedictorian ventriloquist. We all will go far, if we are willing. And go far she did, okay. even taking her act on America's Got Talent. A stolen moment oh, wow. is all that we should. After graduating from Vanderbilt with degrees in economics and finance, she spent seven years in commercial real estate until... I found the Instagram page of the performer who does Abby Kadabi, Leslie Carrera Rudolph, and I just fangirled. I said, oh my God, I love your character and what you do with her. She DM'd me and said, you are a gift. What was it like when you first heard from Megan? There was something super warm and heartfelt about it. And so I, I went and I, I, I Googled her and I was blown away. I just felt like it was magic. Mm -hmm. I know that sounds really corny, but I do feel like it was a meeting of the hearts. Leslie was so impressed with Megan's talents, she became her mentor, sharing her material with Sesame's producer who invited Megan to audition. Last September, making history as the street's first full-time black female puppeteer. I immediately entered my the imagination of my childhood. I still wish I could figure out what kind of job I want to do when I grow up and entering the imagination of a lot of kids with six and three quarter year old Gabrielle. What is it like being here on Sesame Street? Oh, it's so much fun. Oh, the weather is always great. It's always sunny. Mm -hmm. You know, you should really consider being a meteorologist here. Megan, hoping her path to the pinnacle of puppetry inspires others. My goal is just to inspire girls to achieve whatever dream they have, mm. no matter their background, their zip code, or no matter the color of their skin. Sesame's executive producer believes representation is important. We want people to be able to see characters on screen and feel like they see themselves. Those friends that inspired her as a child are her best friends today. Who are some of your friends? Tell me about oh, Well, I got lots of friends. Mm -hmm. I got um, Prairie Dog, uh -huh. Abby, mm -hmm. Elmo, mm -hmm. Cookie Monster, mm -hmm. Gonger, mm -hmm. Grover, yeah. uh, Big Bird. Yeah. So nice to meet you, Gabrielle. Oh, it's so nice to meet you too, Mr. Al. High five. Yeah. Woo! Woo! This boom. 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 Thank you, Al. This year is also the 50th anniversary of hip hop. Craig recently met up with legendary hip hop pioneer Grandmaster Flash and got a sneak peek of the Universal Hip Hop Museum. Take a look. They are a part of music history. Run DMC, Jay Z, Missy Elliott, and the new generation of stars, including Kendrick Lamar. Their success built on the shoulders of legends like Grandmaster Flash. He's one of the earliest pioneers of hip-hop and a champion of the Universal Hip Hop Museum being built in the Bronx, New York. We met up with him at a temporary exhibition just across from the site of the Future Museum.
We're sitting here, you know, just a few feet away from this, this amazing new museum devoted to a genre that you help create. How does that make you feel? It takes me back 50 years. You know, we get a couple of shopping carts and take the speakers and the crates of records and go to the nearest park and just play, you know, and then to, to get here. It's very humbling. Don't push me. Grandmaster Flash and the Furious Five were pioneers of this new form of music in the 70s and 80s and became the first hip hop group inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in 2007. For Flash, it was a dream that started in his childhood home. My biggest sisters was playing anything from disco to funk to pop to rock to Latin. You know, so I was really lucky to grow up with this kaleidoscopic view of, of music. Flash would help develop DJing techniques used around the world. Scratching, looping, sampling, innovations that helped make hip hop the most popular genre of music. Hip hop, the music, the movement will soon have a new home. A two-level universal hip-hop museum being built in the Bronx, set to open next year. With a 52,000 square foot space with interactive exhibits, a performing space, a radio station, and a restaurant. When people come in here, they feel like they're walking into the evolution of, of hip-hop history. Rocky Bucano is the museum's executive director. Why is remembering hip-hop? The music and the culture. Why is that such an important thing? Well, it's, it's super important because this culture was created by black and brown kids from the projects, from the hood. This culture has saved so many kids' lives by giving them an outlet to become something. The memorabilia throughout the current exhibit is an homage to that struggle and success. Because it's a youth movement, South Africa, South America, no matter where you go, the youth have the same issues. Mm. And this music speaks to them. Music that spoke to young kids 50 years ago, inventing the music they needed to find their voices. Do you ever listen to hip hop now and you think, this is not what I intended? I'm happy. I have to be totally, because the way that I see this here is something that is loved by so many people has to change, it has to, it has to go through its changes and do different things. Okay. It has to, otherwise it's stagnant yeah. and it doesn't grow. But you kind of created it. I didn't say that, you did. <laughs> Coming up, three artists on a mission to bring more inclusivity to Hollywood. Plus, we'll introduce you to a couple making waves in the restaurant industry. We're back right after this. <laughs>
The 9B Collective is the first black-owned concept art studio ever created, and they've designed looks for major films like Marvel's Black Panther and Guardians of the Galaxy. NBC's Steve Patterson gives us an inside look. We are home. There is a secret weapon in blockbuster films like Black Panther and Wakanda Forever. I am queen of the most powerful nation in the world! and other Marvel productions like Moon Knight and Guardians of the Galaxy. We thank you, Guardians, for putting your lives on the line. Not to mention countless costumes, video games, TV shows, and the other worldly places our favorite characters live in. No matter the vision, it all starts with a digital pen. Michael Wandi and Phil Boutte, along with his childhood friend, actor Aldous Hodge, form the 9B Collective. What's a concept artist? We're the first stab at visuals for what uh, characters or environments or creatures or props or whatever it is can be. And we're basically trying to get things to be approved by a director or producer before they have to go and build every single thing, right? Everything that's designed starts with the drawing first. How many drawings do you do before they're shooting? Many, and many that um, the general public doesn't even get to see. There's a lot of work to figure out who this person is or what they look like or why they're wearing what they're wearing or why they're making these choices, um, you know, visually. Phil helped create costumes for Madonna's three world tours. Mike helped create characters like Ahsoka Tano on the Mandalorian TV series. And they both have been drawn since they were kids, saying they quickly found they were outliers in the industry. I was like, Huh, I don't see anyone else who looks like me doing this. I've been doing, you know, costume and character and stuff like that from 2007. The first time I sat next to another black artist doing my job was 2019. And that was <laughs> and that's even after Black Panther, right? My Ruth Carter was my first black boss. I hope through my example, this means that there is hope. Ruth Carter was the first black woman to win an Oscar in 2019 for her costumes in Black Panther. How difficult is it to sort of change minds? Always the, I'm a glass half full guy, but I'm also a realist and this change needs to happen a little bit faster. And that's exactly why we're here trying to do what we do. What is it like for people of color to be doing the job that you do and really just for artists and people in the industry to find work? So it's really rare. And I think also it's another thing that is not really pushed in our culture to have that as a creative outlet. So that's another part of 9B is like showing up to school and informing the students and letting them know that this is a possible and viable option for a career. We notice that often, especially people of color, get hired for what they've done, not for their potential. So we flipped that. We're hiring people for their potential and not just what they've done. They just need a, you know, an opportunity. And the silver lining of the opportunity, Aldis says, is a growing community. We get to have a freedom to fully be who we are in our own space, in a safe space, without having to deal with cultural negligence. The 9B artists really do make magic with those pens, turning details about ordinary me into a huge surprise. Who's this? Oh, oh, where are you from? What? <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Is that me? Yeah. <laughs> Did you draw that? Look at that. The color came from Earth, but then also from Michigan State. Up here, you have your wife, dog, and cat. Seeing this and hearing what you put into making me, uh, which is weird, it's so weird to look at me right now. <laughs> um, I, I get it, I get it a lot more. Did a really good job. Thanks, Steve. Up next, a couple's incredible story of resilience. Stay tuned for more.
back with a story about a couple making waves in the restaurant industry. Caval and Rhea Graham opened their Caribbean restaurant during the pandemic, and it's now one of the hottest spots in Brooklyn. I recently paid a visit to find out their recipe for success. Caval and Rhea Graham are living a life they never could have imagined. I love hospitality. I never thought that I would have my own restaurant. But as we look back, we kind of see that every step that we took was actually leading us to this moment. Today, they are the parents of three young children and will celebrate five years of marriage. But it's their journey to this point, running Kokomo, a popular pan-Caribbean restaurant with Indian and Asian flavors that combines their passion for food and hospitality. Clearly, you both had some kind of restaurant background. Started off in um, nightlife and then became uh, roving chefs, uh, me and the, the guys that I had a group with. At the time, I was a marketing manager for a Caribbean restaurant as well. They were soon married and hesitantly decided their next move together would be a restaurant. So they took to social media, documenting everything about acquiring and opening a restaurant. As they were just about to open, the pandemic hit. Against all odds, they officially opened in the summer of 2020. How challenging was it? I would say it was like mental warfare because you really did not know what to expect. But I think because we were so open about our feelings to our social media, people wanted to genuinely support. Something that's very inspirational because Rhea was a part of every step during pregnancy it motivated me to even work harder. The couple describes the menu as elevated Caribbean fare, served up in an atmosphere that feels like the Caribbean. I would say if you're looking for a vibe, come here. We represent all different parts of the Caribbean. We definitely appeal to all ethnicities, you know, whether it's Afro-Caribbean, Latin Caribbean, you know, uh, Asian Caribbean. Did you get inspiration for different recipes? I mean, how did you do it? We were very passionate about like bringing out things that we grew up on, you know, tapping into our Caribbean heritage. Do you feel like you are blazing a trail? Real trailblazers for us are the grandmas, man, because there's nothing like a Caribbean grandma in that kitchen showing her stuff. And now we're just trying to modernize it and just make it into something fresh and new. Some of their hottest Caribbean dishes are on flatbread. The yeah, island pasta flatbread on any given day because it's, uh, it's something that we, we reinvented. And I think everybody comes in and like, they can't get that nowhere else. It's yeah. served with shrimp, oxtail, mm -hmm. chicken. Once we saw that brick oven, we knew we had to do a ode to Brooklyn mm -hmm. by having a brick oven pizza crust. And then we tap on top of it a tomato confit sauteed shrimp with aki, which is the national fruit of Jamaica. I had to give the food a try. So this is our Rasta balls. Okay. Croquette fried Italian Alfredo sauce. Ooh. That we infuse with some jerk seasoning. Ooh. Aioli on top. Can I try it? Of course. The flavor's bursting in your mouth. Oh my gosh. This alone would have me coming back. As they embrace this family-run business, they reflect on this moment in time. Everything that you need to succeed is within you. We come from very humble beginnings. Our parents struggled. I know how hard, excuse me, <clears throat> I know how hard they worked to leave a path for myself and how hard we as parents worked for us to be where we are. I take none of it for granted and you can achieve anything you want as long as you believe in yourself. That's it for our Discover Black Heritage special. Thank you for tuning in and we'll see you next time on Today All Day. Now to our series together, we rise celebrating black culture and contributions. And today we want you to meet Charleston chef Kevin Mitchell. Kevin's been cooking since he was a kid and became the first African-American chef instructor at the Culinary Institute of Charleston at Trident Tech, where he's serving up some Southern comfort. Oh. Take a look. What is that at the bottom of the pan? Fond. Fond. And what is fond? Crispy bits. Crispy bits that come off the... Salmon. It's one thing to know how to put a piece of fish into a pan, but I always tell my students that in order for you to be a really great chef, you have to understand where the food comes from. Kevin Mitchell has become one of Charleston's most distinguished chefs, wearing many hats, instructor, culinary historian, and scholar. His passion to preserve Southern ingredients and champion the historical significance of African-American culture through food 
is always present. I've always said that in order for us to understand where we go, we have to understand where we came from. And we always have to understand the people that lay that foundation. Without them, there is no us. Without these enslaved cooks, there is no Chef Kevin Mitchell. I first discovered food in the kitchen of my grandmother's home. At six years old, she started teaching me how to cook. I really believe that she saw something in me and that connection with her in the kitchen led me to, to this path that I've been on. That path has led Mitchell to head up kitchens and restaurants around the country. But his love of Southern food eventually lured him back to the South. Nothing's better than for me to use something that was locally grown in South Carolina. A food does unite people. And depending on the types of conversations you, you're having, it can divide and what I try to do is bring people together. How great is it to sit around a table and have dialogue with someone centered around a bunch of food? I think it's the greatest thing on the planet. Kevin, what a beautiful <laughs> tribute you. to you. And Thank your you grandmother so got a nice shout out yes. there too. Yes, I'm Very sure she's sweet. At home crying, but oh, <laughs> no. yes. talk to us about what you're gonna cook for us today. All right, so I'm gonna do a dish that I call peas and greens, where mm -hmm. I'm bringing together black eyed peas and collard greens together mm. in the same pot. Mm -hmm. But also adding a couple different ingredients that people may or may not um, associate with, with black eyed peas. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so we start with some black eyed peas that we've soaked overnight. Um, this will help reduce the cooking time. Okay. So it, then we put them in the pot, a little bit of water, a generous amount of salt, mm -hmm. and then I throw in a couple cloves of garlic. Do you just do whole cloves like that? Yes, yeah. whole cloves mm -hmm. of garlic, some fresh thyme sprigs, and then we bring it to a boil, and then turn down the heat, and then we let it simmer until about you know, 30, 35 minutes until the peas are um, nice and tender. You don't want to cook them too far because you're going to continue the cooking process when you uh, add some if, of the if other ingredients. If you don't have time or you forget to soak it, how long is, is um, the cooking time? You can time? still take the peas and soak them in boiling water oh, for oh. about an hour. Oh. Or there are some grocery stores that actually have peas oh, so. already either in the in the can or they already mm -hmm. have them in a plastic container that okay. you can use those as well. So now you're going to make kind of the sauce, right? Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. So we start with some onions that we uh, caramelize and a little bit of oil, mm -hmm. olive oil or um, even coconut oil, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. adds a little bit more coconut flavor mm -hmm. um, with the milk. Mm -hmm. And then what Salt? we do is, yeah, we season it. Okay. Right? And we so remember when we're cooking, uh, cooking is adding foundation, so we always okay. season as we add in ingredients, so we can add in our spices. Hot so chili flakes. Hot chili flakes. Should I add these in? Not yet. Okay. okay. And What's then this we're one? gonna do that is a little bit of ground ginger. Oh mm. yeah. Right. And What's then that? we have some turmeric. Turmeric. Oh, we have a little thing. Is right that here. garlic? Chopped garlic. That's, that's some chopped garlic. What's, what's this guy? And that is um, some curry powder. Curry. Yeah. And we cook okay. that down and we cook it until it becomes fragrant, which mm -hmm. basically means you can start to smell the mm -hmm. spices mm -hmm. cook. You want to do that with dry spices because you want to bring out that yeah. that flavor. Yes. Right? And once you get that flavor in there, then you can start adding some of like your wet tomatoes. ingredients. Right. Yeah. So you can add in what your your wet ingredients. This is the reserve cooking liquid from the peas, oh. which actually adds a little bit more of the pea flavor. Then it is also cream. That's coconut milk. Coconut milk. Right? So and this is a whole coconut Do you extra extra again. Before I put that in there, <laughs> she loves coconut. We I have some uh, coconut milk. And we have our um, okay. vegetable stock. You can use chicken stock or okay. water. And you cook this down until it starts to thicken, and that's what that uh, pea liquid does ah. because it has a lot of starch from the peas in that. Okay. Yeah. Then of course it'll cook down with the tomatoes and it'll actually thicken it as well. Does this then, go in there? Or yes. No? Then we do. I do the peas that after, have been cooked. Yeah. After they that go, cooks. In, okay. go in here. Come, let's try it. And then. I'm going to pour these yeah, two. Go right ahead. And then we add the greens um, long there enough so the, the residual heat from the from the pan just cooks the greens. You don't want to overcook them. You want to make sure they continue to stay and green. And then you just grill a piece of salmon and put it right on top? <clears throat> yeah. So we have mm. a piece of salmon that we've created a blackening spice. Mm. So it's got some um, cayenne. Mm. There's some paprika. Mm. This is delicious. Thank you so much. It's a little oh heat. Thank you so much. It has mm. got a little bit of heat to it from the from the, mm. um, chili, pepper. From the chili pepper. Seven. And also that 
curry actually it's adds a little bit so of heat too. good. Thank you so much. That, that, I bet your you. grandma's super proud. Oh, she is. To get the recipe, head to today's slash, uh, uh, today.com slash food. Kevin's going to be hosting the Roots of Rice. It's at the Charleston uh, Wine and Food Festival. And he, here's a beautiful Beth. cookbook the book too. It's a gorgeous. What's the name of your cookbook? It's called Taste the State, South Carolina's mm. Signature Foods, their uh, recipes and their stories. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Kevin, it's, this is too good. <laughs> And we are back with today's food. This morning's guest, Kwame Onwachi, a James Beard Award winner. You may have seen him as both a contestant and recurring judge on Top Chef. He's also, by the way, opened five restaurants, all before turning 30. And now he's out with a follow-up to his acclaimed memoir. It actually is his first cookbook. It's fantastic. It's called My America, Recipes from a Young Black Chef. Kwame, so good to see you. Man, I'm, I'm so curious about how you, in this book, have taken your whole history, like from Nigeria to mm -hmm. the Caribbean to Louisiana to the Bronx, and how have this book has been just basically your lifeline. For sure. You know, it's my version of what... I found American cuisine as a kid. When you're a kid, you're not asking like, what ethnicity is this when you're eating food? You right. know, I know I'm in America and I'm eating something. So that was American food to me. So it shows a lexicon of how diverse American What do you remember is. about being in little Jamaica in the Bronx eating food that you're about to make for us today? Jerk chicken. I remember sitting on the side of the road with my father, getting jerk chicken out of a barrel um, and getting sauce all over my face. What is jerk sauce? What is jerk? So uh, jerk sauce, you know, it started as an act of like preservation, but it's a, it's a sauce that has so many different layers of flavor. Um, it, it starts with a marinade, yeah. and you marinate this, this chicken or pork or, or vegetables in this sauce, and then it's smoked and let's grilled. Get, let's get to it. So the, the jerk sauce, I always recommend making this from scratch. So I have a pepper sauce here. It's mm -hmm. pretty much a scotch bonnet puree. Um, we have thyme. We have... Um, a little bit of tamarind, we have scallion, ginger, garlic, and soy sauce, and then allspice, cinnamon, and bay leaf and clove. We're gonna put that in the blender, act yep. like this blender's yep. going. Yeah, no need to do that. <laughs> well, then the, the sauce comes out like this. So I Is like it in make, like the barbecue sauce family? Is um, it? No, but you can make a barbecue sauce, which we're gonna do now. Okay. So we have ginger and garlic and onion sweating. You know, you add some ketchup to this, you add some brown sugar, and then you add your jerk paste, and then you let this simmer for about 30 minutes until it gets nice, deep, and dark like this. I was saying when I went to uh, spring break on MTV, we flew into Montego Bay, and there was, the weather was so bad, I had to drive to the grill, and uh, we stopped on the street along yeah. the way, and I had my first jerk chicken. It's like a culinary thing I'll never forget. Your first real jerk chicken, Is it a right? street food? Is yeah, it's actually, it's actually a street food. Um, there's a lot of history in it, and that's the beautiful thing about My America. It gets into the history of the dishes and why they stood the test of time. Perfect. So you got your jerk barbecue. You can blend it if you want um, to make it smooth. I like mine a little bit chunky. The difference between my jerk chicken recipe is I like to brine the chicken. Yep. I like to infuse the flavor deep into it. So like I have an overnight brine sort of thing? Overnight brine. Uh, you have your flavors of your jerk uh, paste in the brine as mm -hmm. well. Mm -hmm. And then you'll marinate it, 
throw it on the grill. I love it. We're in the studio. You like to outside cook this, though. Yeah, because you got to add some smoke to it, you know. What kind uh, of wood chips do you like? I like to use pimento wood. The wow, wood never comes, heard of that. that. That, you know, grows the allspice berries, right. so you accentuate those flavors. Let's see our little chefs over there. What do you think of the jerk chicken? Our plates are almost empty. Are you no. serious? I don't, now you don't. <coughs> Come on. We, we, we got oh plenty. Oh, my God. Oh, my right. God. We need more. You know what's interesting? A lot of times jerk chicken, it's just there's, it's too wet. There's too much jerk sauce. Yours is perfect mm -hmm. because just a little bit, mm -hmm. and it gives you that hit. You know? well, so good. It, when you do it properly, like it's such a refined dish. You know. What is doing it properly? What are the cooking tips on the chicken? How does it differ? You from gotta, the you gotta smoke it. You know, you gotta cook it in the grill. You gotta let it marinate. You gotta make your jerk seasoning from from scratch, mm -hmm. and that's how you build those layers of flavor. Mm -hmm. Is this well, what you're going to make it? You got, but we have to plug the family reunion because it's so Yeah, cool. the Just family reunion. say what it is, everybody. So the family reunion is this, uh, you know, four-day food festival at the Salamander Resort and Spa. We get some of the best chefs together in the Ooh. country and food professionals mm. and, and entertainers as well. So um, it's it's really exciting. Tickets drop today, everybody. Of course they I want to see all of you oh at the God. family reunion. <laughs> what is the side dish, by the way? The side dish is sautéed uh, cabbage and carrots. Oh my God! How's that, guys? Good. I mean, are you kidding That's me? Amazing. You know what we need? We need rum punch. <laughs> a little, a little rum oh, punch. I got. Well, some. <laughs> <laughs> well congratulations Fantastic. on everything, man. Thank Looking you. forward to Thank the you. family reunion. The book is beautiful too. Yeah, Thank you so much. Uh, great writing, great recipes, and this looks delicious. So there's a good lesson on jerk chicken. Kwame, thank you. That recipe, Yum. by the way, is on our website today.com/food. And for the cookbook, check out today.com/shop. It is awesome. Our friend and star of Food Network's delicious Miss Brown. Cartier Brown cooking up cornbread. Hey, Hello. Hello. South Carolina's finest. Absolutely. Charleston. Charleston, South they Carolina. They know cornbread right. in Charleston. That's, that's what we do here. Okay, so I'm making a jalapeno cheddar honey cornbread. Wow. So it's a lot of flavor. Okay? Hold on, uh, Chanel's got a joke about the jalapeno. What you got? Oh, shoot. You put me on the spot. <laughs> um... Never mind. I don't Never mind. It's, it's okay. <laughs> put it, put it it was, you okay. don't want to get it. You, you can't be all jalapeno in my business. No. It's, oh, in your face. Uh, yeah. Is that it? Something. Yeah, that's okay, okay, you put me on the spot. <laughs> you take the seeds out. Take the seeds out, okay. dice it up. What you're going to end Always up with is out. these right here, these little cute little cubes right here. So you're going to just dump it right into the wet ingredients, okay? Mm. And what, so is that, what do we have there? So that's buttermilk and milk, okay? Buttermilk and milk, 50-50. 50-50, so all right? Got some green onions. Mm. Got some sharp cheddar cheese, mm. all right? So it's cheddar, honey, and jalapenos, okay? okay? You got two eggs. And just a little bit of butter. And just a little bit. <laughs> a whole lot it. of butter. I love it. That's, mm. so That's about two sticks of butter, okay? All right. All right. So whisk that up. Once you whisk it up, you're going to pour it right in here. Now, I'm also doing half and half, half cornmeal, half flour, all right? Why is that? It gives it more of a, see, I like a very cakey cake type mm -hmm. of cornbread. Because, uh, you know, we grew up in the South. We yeah. eat like a very crumbly cornbread. Mm -hmm. You don't really want, I like a more cakey, more sweet now, cornbread. Do you, do you have like a baking powder in there? Or is this a self rising Okay, so no, this is, I have baking soda, uh -huh. salt, and garlic powder, uh, all right? Okay. So super flavorful, mm -hmm. right? Whisk that up. You want to pour it into your hot cast iron skillet. I love a good cast iron oh, yeah. skillet. You're going to get this nice crispy crust. And mm -hmm. what you're going to get is this right here. It's topped with cheddar cheese, more jalapenos, so and good. butter. You know Perfect. what I was saying to you? It's so, the combination is so good because it's not too spicy, your jalapeno. Right, right. Because the honey The honey it. balances all out, okay? Really good. So you got some leftover. We got leftover, yes. we got leftover cornbread right. here, all right? So what I'm going to do is make cornbread croutons. Ooh. Yes. So we're gonna make it into like one oh, inch good. cube. Uh -huh. Oh, the cheese on top. That's that's. Uh huh. So you get Next a little level. cheesy cornbread. Mm -hmm. So what you got here? Uh oh, we lost the cornbread. Oh, boy. Make one Five inch seconds. squares here, mm -hmm. okay? So you gotta dump into a bowl. All right. Toss it with a little bit of uh, olive oil. Yeah. Okay. Salt, pepper. Mm -hmm. Toss it around, put it on parchment paper, bake it until it's nice and crispy. All right. Great idea. And now you're gonna use Got a this? bowl of romaine here. Romaine, mm -hmm. rotisserie chicken. You can use fried chicken if so you want. Whatever. Okay, we're gonna add in some shaved parm. Mm hmm. Make it a mess. Some bacon. Right. Everything's better with bacon. Of course. Right. It is. <laughs> and Ooh. your crispy croutons, mm -hmm. all right? And you got your Caesar dressing. Caesar here. dressing here, homemade. Toss it up. Made with a little bit of uh, Dijon mustard, some mayo. Phenomenal. Toss it up. Put it in a the bowl there, serve it over some Parmesan. That's terrific. And since Delicious. this is Make Ahead Monday, we're doing it three different we're gonna ways. Do, now we got breakfast. You got dinner, lunch, breakfast, okay. all right? So we got some uh, the leftover cornbread here in a bowl, mm -hmm. all right? To right. so that nice. bowl, we're going to add eggs. Yes. Okay. Country sausage. Mm -hmm. Country sausage. Uh -huh. That's in the that, That's pork. Not pork, but pork. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. More green onion. Boom. All right. And some milk because so it has to be oh. nice and wet and moist, okay? Mm -hmm. Oh, my gosh. You get that fully incorporated. Yeah. 
add that to a, a cast up uh, well uh, a waffle, waffle iron that's sprayed with a little bit of oil mm -hmm. what you're gonna get is this oh my gosh beauty right here and hold on not to to, to take it up a notch yeah. a little bit of hot sauce but Ooh. I've also Call made a hot sauce in my bag spicy maple syrup oh, so it's getting. a mixture of hot sauce and maple syrup mm. listen this okay is phenomenal it's, it's the combination of flavors it really makes it's it sweet it's spicy it's savory it's it's everything i, I mean don't Party throw away that old cornbread mm -hmm. so right. good thank you. Right, thank, thank you thank you for these recipes <laughs> today.com oh slash food Okay, you know that in that moment, Hoda, where mm -hmm. you take a bite of something mm -hmm. so delicious mm -hmm. you can actually taste the love that went into it? Well, that is the kind of food that Harlem chef Tammy Treadwell makes, and her cooking is just part of what draws the crowds in. Take a look. That's love. Wait till you taste that. Right in the heart of Harlem in a 15-square-foot food truck. I got four po boys here. Yes, that's me. You'll find po' boys, shrimp and grits, and a whole lot of good vibes. I tell people all the time on my corner, on 125th Street, there's nothing but love. Love and Harlem are two things that are part of Chef Tammy Treadwell's DNA. In this neighborhood that's in every part of who you are. We are sitting in the Harlem Rose Garden. This is like so surreal because I've often said I'm that flower or that rose that will break through the concrete. No matter what you pour on me, I'm gonna emerge stronger and stronger. Throughout Tammy's sometimes challenging life, food has been what she calls her love language. I cannot talk about food without talking about my grandmother because her spirit is with me everywhere I go. I got my love of cooking from hanging around in the kitchen with her, mm. not wanting to go outside because she was cooking and I wanted to be first in line to get the plate. There was a lot of people <laughs> in my house. After surviving cancer and getting laid off from her job, Tammy felt a calling to feed people. I'm taking care of all the flavors. In 2016, she broke through the male-dominated food truck industry and opened Harlem Seafood Soul. The idea that you had, like, all the things you had to overcome in your life. At your core, are you an optimist? Unbelievably. We live in a world of possibilities. I'll show you it can be done. Then in March of 2020, the unthinkable happened. Tammy was forced to shut her truck down. Then her husband, Greg, passed away from COVID. What did you lose that day? I lost my best friend. We had 38 amazing years mm -hmm. together. One thing I know for sure is that man loved me. I have never had a doubt that his love is real. There's a period 
in between fetal position mm -hmm. and standing up. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. And there's mm -hmm. something that happens in that moment where it changes. What made you say, it's time to get out from under these covers? Mm -hmm. I started seeing the faces of the people in my family. They were looking at me for the first time like they were very concerned. Every time I would hit a wall emotionally, or I felt like, you know, I'm, today, I, today's not the day, I'm gonna lay back down today. Mm -hmm. And my granddaughter would say to me, Grandma, mm -hmm. when you going to cook for the people again? <laughs> this time I looked at her like, hmm. you know, that's a good question. You know what we love about you is that you're not only sharing your love through your food, you're also sharing your love through helping others. Mm -hmm. That was the only motivation I had to cook, was to do something for someone else. I had to put my grief on the mm. side and move forward. Mm. And that's what I did. When, when the doors opened, <laughs> and did you wonder, are they gonna remember me? Yeah, I stood there for a little while like, Okay, I know y'all smell me. <laughs> and I literally turned around um, to, I guess, stir the grits or do something. And when I turned back around, there was a line. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There was a line. And there had to be, you know, at least a dozen people standing yes. in line. And they were waiting for me. <laughs> and they were smiling. And they were like, where you been? Oh. And we're glad to see you back here. Harlem is a village. That's how I was always raised to believe. There's a lot of love in this land. Mm. Just wait till you get the experience. Wait. Let's go. All right. Yes, let's go. Today, just shy of 60 and after a lifetime of hardship, Chef Tammy says she's in her prime and she'll remain on that corner as long as the community allows her to stay. Jenna, I'm gonna give you a little day. Thank you. Stay okay, ready. I have worked so hard for so many years and now I get to do what makes me happy. This morning on Today Food, a delicious way to celebrate back black history as part of our special series, Together We Rise. Joining us now is Bryant Terry. He's a James Beard and NAACP Image Award-winning vegan chef, food justice activist, and author. His latest book is called, and it is terrific, mm. Black Food, Stories, <laughs> Art, and Recipes from Across the African Diaspora. Mm, that's right. This morning, uh, he's sharing a new take on two classic cuisines. Chef Brian, good morning to you. Good morning. Hey, Chef. Good morning, guys. Thank you so much for having me on today. Absolutely. Even the book is even just beautiful, quite frankly, yeah. uh, to have in, in the house. Let's let's dig in. What are we starting with? So we are going to start with one of the recipes in this book by brilliant national based chef Charles Hunter III, and they're called lace hoe cakes. You might be wondering, well, what is it? How, what's that name about? 
And actually during the antebellum period, uh, many enslaved Africans would actually take the metal part from the hoe that would be used in the fields and you could remove it, put it over an open fire, they would put a little fat on there and then people could have this mixture of cornmeal, some water and actually fry it on the, um, the, the metal part of the hoe and you have these delicious flat cakes. So Ooh. that's that's the inspiration. You know, this is something that's ubiquitous in a lot of African American cooking. Um, Johnny cakes is one of the other terms, or, which is thought to be a corruption of journey cakes because they traveled well. Mm-hmm. You can have them easily when you're out and about. So should I get started? Should yeah, I get started? Do, it, do it. All right. So um, let me just say this. If you have corn, if we were in the summertime, we'd actually add fresh corn to this recipe. Mm-hmm. But because we're in the dead of winter and we don't have any, we're going to omit the corn and just use the uh, cornmeal mixture as the, the primary flavor. We have some onions that have been sauteed until they're translucent. I am going to add a little black pepper, a little bit of salt, and then some garlic, mm. right? So that's going to add, um, you know, those alliums is really going to add a lot of flavor to this. If you could boil a pot of water, you can make this recipe. That is how simple it is. So let me tell you the, the, the ingredients. We have some cornmeal. We have a lightly beaten egg, some um, buttermilk, and then a little butter. And through the magic of uh, TV, okay. we have everything already combined. Okay. So once everything is combined, we simply want to uh, give it a good stir. And, you know, you don't want to over stir it. You want to stir, stir it until it's just mixed. We can actually add everything in this pot uh-huh. in here. And um, yeah, it's simply a matter of cooking the cakes after that. So the thing I say is, you know, this is slow and low, kind of like, you know, barbecue. You want to cook these slowly mm-hmm. and, and, and not too much because you don't want the outside to be cooked. And then you have this kind of cakey inside. Mm-hmm. So once this is cooked, we want to put the heat on, I don't know, medium heat. Uh, medium high, and then we simply look at that. Take a scooper, uh huh, and then we can oh, add this come on. to our pan. Let me let let me just come show on. you guys. Let's what's see, going let's on see. In there. <laughs> so um, the thing is, obviously, you don't want to overcrowd the pan. You right. know, I typically will do a couple of the um, cakes at a time. Mm-hmm. Once they're done, what I like to do is keep the oven on low heat and just kind of store uh, the cakes in there as I'm cooking so that once everything is cooked, oh, they're actually yum. Be And then how do you, do you serve them just like that? Oh, no. We got to put a little so, uh What we're going to do is uh, uh, for this one, we're doing a molasses butter. Right? Oh. So we have, <laughs> I know you guys like butter. <laughs> so we have, our, we have our butter here. I am going to add some um, molasses. And, mm. you know, like I said, this is, this is a pretty simple recipe. Once everything's added, you simply want to mix it up. Hmm. I'll have some molasses then, butter. <laughs> Yum. Da, 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 da. Okay. Let's see, let's, let's see. see. That's oh. Oh. These are Hold finished cake. Now, oh. um, Ch- Charles Hunter suggests that we uh, give it a little garnish with some smoked paprika Ooh. and, yeah, and savory, some green sweet. onions sure. and oh, like this. Yeah. And now, are we serving this for breakfast? Dish. Are we serving this for lunch? Yeah, when are we serving it's, this? It's, so the beautiful thing about these is that they can pivot easily from a breakfast treat to a snack to a dinner treat, right? So you can have them with maple syrup. But what we're doing with these is I actually prepared um, these slow braised mustard greens. So, you know, dark leafy greens are one of the staple ingredients throughout um, a lot of Western Central Africa. You know, pretty much all over the African diaspora, you're going to find dark leafy greens, but definitely in the South. What I did in this, I cooked the greens, and this is beautiful um, broth. I know you not you guys know about this. It's called the pot liquor, right? Oh yes. Uh-huh. Here we go. Just have a couple All seconds, the, Chef. <laughs> okay. So look, we're gonna add some um, caramelized onions mm, in here mm, with mm, the tomatoes. Mm. We're gonna um, sprinkle it with some jalapeno oh, and a little bit of this yeah. hot pepper vinegar. Oh, All right. Next time, oh, bring it to Chef Bryant Terry. It looks fantastic. For the yeah. recipes, by the way, go Thank to you, chef. dot com slash food. You and for the book, Black Food, check out today.com slash shop. Thank you.
Welcome to The Boost. Uh, we have a special show for you today, celebrating black heritage. Let's start at a coffee shop in North Carolina, serving up not only that cup of joe, but also an entire library, a library that's dedicated to preserving black culture. Bring Alexander is that story. You notice it the second you step into Archive Cafe. It feels like walking into my grandma's living room. <laughs> The warm embrace of a familiar past. On the shelves, Maya Angelou, Dick Gregory, and some of the finest VHS tapes the 90s had to offer. Then there are the magazines. You have the Ebony from 1969. Black Stars, Vibe, and of course, Ebony and Jet. Look at that one, Earth, Wind, and Fire. For Cherise Terry, it's a collection she's been building for nearly a decade. Do you remember getting your first, was it an Ebony magazine? It was an Ebony magazine. Yeah. It was a Dick Gregory cover with all his children. You went from that one Dick Gregory cover to now you have how many, would you say? 5,000 plus. 5,000? Yes. yes. Now she's turned it into a full-fledged business, Archive CLT in West Charlotte. Now that we have this space for coffee and meetings, it's, it's, it means everything to this community. This is black love. This is black feeling. This is black vibe carefully curated to pay tribute to black culture. From the decor, to the artwork, the coffee beans, even the drink names. Master, Master Blaster, Blaster, Stevie, Stevie Wonder. Wonder. Yes. <laughs> the house favorite, the Foxy Brown, a nod to both the movie and the rapper. I see why this is a favorite. It even oh extends goodness. to the bathroom. <laughs> this whole bathroom is a vibe. Thank you. And you don't really say that about bathrooms. No, people come in and they say, I just never want to leave. I just want to read the article. When people walk out of here, what do you want them to take with them? A sense of pride. Mm -hmm. Whether you're black or not, um, understanding our contributions were important. Cherie started her journey as a way to feel closer to her mom, who died in 2014 when Cherise was 24 years old. I wanted to know what the culture was like when she was coming up. Her and I always shopped together, and we've always been attracted to vintage items and clothes styles. Mm -hmm. And so I wanted to know what ignited that. And so me just going down the rabbit hole of all the black publications from the 70s just like woke something up inside of me. What do you feel like you learned about your mom along the way? Oh, she was jazzy. I mean, it explains the uh, eight tracks in the house, wake up, listen to Marvin Gaye. Mm -hmm. So the music aspect, I knew and I loved. So once I seen the images, it made sense, like her flair, her flavor. Now she's using that inspiration to inspire others, starting in the same community where she grew up. Cherise travels the country, scouring yard sales and shops for her magazines. And sometimes they just find her. It, a lady called and said that her aunt was throwing away some Jet magazines. Mm -hmm. Would I want them? So I'm like, oh, cool. I'm, I'm thinking maybe four or five or 10 or 20. Yeah. Those 1,400 Jet magazines that she has collected since the 50s. 1,400? 1,400 magazines. What does that tell you about the power of these magazines? The power of unity and understand that it is important for me to share with the next generation. Now, as a mother herself to 17-year-old Kaylee, 13-year-old Taylor, and 8-year-old Bailey, Sharice is doing just that, building a business and a legacy for her own daughters to cherish. I want them to have the courage to step out on faith and believe in themselves and to achieve and contribute to your community. It's instilled for them to carry it on, and I believe that they will. Cheers to that. Thank you. <laughs> now we turn to a Chicago nonprofit with the goal to combat food insecurity and in the process provide stability and change lives. Beacons come in all shapes and sizes. For example, this refrigerator covered in colorful paint that sits outside a liquor store in the Inglewood section of Chicago. Every day, Dion Dawson makes a delivery. How you doing? He packs it full of fresh fruits, vegetables, and water for anyone who needs it. Tell me about this community fridge. There's no fresh produce. And it's in a neighborhood where we're in the bottom 10% of average household income. And so we started this community fridge. What was the response to that? Oh, no, they were like, what is this? <laughs> <laughs> Who's leaving all this fresh fruit? Like, what is this? But the beautiful thing is that I came back every day after that. The only two things we say, get enough to, you know, last to tomorrow because we'll be back and ladies first. Dion's easy charm masks a dedication rooted 
in his own experience growing up in Inglewood. We were homeless a lot of years, lived on people's couches, being separated from my brothers. So, I mean, my norm was just always like a state of uh, flux. How does that shape you? What does that, what does that do to a young man? What it did was it allowed me to have like a different type of empathy. That has been the game changer for, you know, leading this organization. Now, this organization is more than just a refrigerator. It's Dion's Chicago dream. In 2020, after the success of the community fridge, Dion set out to feed more families. With communication skills learned in the Navy, Dion was able to raise money to buy fresh produce to deliver right to someone's door. By the end of the year, I want to be at all seven locations. Okay. If you ask Dion, the ways we feed most of the food insecure don't work. He's seen that broken system up close. I realized that it was still the same from when I was a kid. Nothing had changed. Still feeding people outside. They're facing the elements unlabeled cans and off-brand, you know, oatmeal. People who sign up for Dion's nonprofit delivery service get a dream box stuffed with fruits and vegetables. To do it, Dion's team took over an old YMCA building where they packed the boxes. He has 14 employees who he pays at least 20 bucks an hour. They have a fleet of vehicles to make the rounds to more than 560 families, handing out about 23,000 pounds of food a month. Raylon Whitcomb was one of the first employees. He says they're filling a vital need caused by a lack of access to fresh food. So it may be one good store down the street, but in a lot of neighborhoods, it's not the best stores. Lack of transportation is a big thing, too. I hopped in with Dion to follow one of his team's delivery routes. So is this part of the area that you service? With Dream Deliveries, yeah, we're in 26 Chicago land neighborhoods. Oh, so it's all over. Oh, yeah, we're in a 45 mile radius. We watched as they delivered to Sherry Phillips. Oh, thank you. What has it meant for you to, to get that box every week? Oh, it means a lot because uh, if I don't eat it, my grandkids eat it, or my great grandkids, or I'll take it and uh, pass it around. Share, I share it. Sharing, making sure everyone has enough to eat. Oh, two of these, that's enough for me. That's why every morning you'll find Dion still stocking his community fridge. It's a beacon for hope. Coming up, more celebrations of black heritage, including how hit filmmaker Jordan Peele changed one man's life with a single phone call. Welcome back to The Boost. Up next, a change maker celebrating black history all year round, even turning it into a game. Take a look. We should be celebrating black history. We should be excited about who we are. We should be excited about what we've accomplished. We should be excited about the future. And it should embolden us to demand more, to stand up straighter, and to be confident about the direction we're headed in. Each word spoken by Unique Jones Gibson illustrates her strong sense of pride. Eight years ago, she started Because of Them We Can, now an award-winning multimedia platform amplifying black innovators and trendsetters 
all year long. For people who don't know about Because of Them We Can, talk about why you decided to create it. I wanted to essentially refresh Black history. At the time, I just had two little sons. Uh, We were also at the one year anniversary of Trayvon Martin's murder. And I was trying to think, well, how can I inject my kids with like the self-esteem that they'll need to be able to survive and thrive in this world? Unique took photographs of her oldest son and other children dressed as iconic figures, hoping they would feel connected to people who've paved the way. My son looked like Muhammad Ali, but he never knew why Muhammad Ali said he was the greatest. He never knew why Muhammad Ali had to project the confidence before the world validated him. And so I thought, wow, what if I just put them in the shoes of these trailblazers, associate words that they've said and put it into the universe, and then it just blew up. A project originally meant to last only 28 days went viral. I didn't have this big grand plan. I remember Harry Washington was tweeting me because she saw the picture of the little girl who was dressed like her. And in that moment, I knew this was so much bigger than me. It's about empowering these kids. In an effort to further sustain representation that matters, Unique created videos like this take on Maya Angelou's classic poem, Phenomenal Woman. I'm a woman. Phenomenal woman, that's us. That a child has that self-esteem, self-confidence, they know who they are. Why is that so important? Yeah, it's important because it, it impacts how you move throughout the world. It impacts how you engage with people every single day. If we make sure that their foundation is solid, if we make sure that they are rooted with knowledge and information, no one can take that from them. The wife and mom of now three keeps expanding her work. She's developed a website and Instagram page spotlighting stories without stereotypes. Her latest venture is a game, Culture Tags. Seven categories, church, family and friends, uh, daily sayings, words to live by, film and television, uh, songs and lyrics, uh, black Twitter. And the family packages doorstep deliveries. Talk to me about starting subscription boxes and what that's all about. One day it just hit me, a subscription box. You could put the same props that you use from your photographs. You could do a step further and provide them with curriculum um, that would tie to math and science and reading and writing. This is an investment. By getting this content on a monthly basis, your child celebrates Black history every single month. You have a pledge on your website. I will honor the sacrifices of my ancestors. I will believe in me. I will pursue my dreams. I will help others along the way. It is something that we can all take and that we can all commit to. If people take anything away from this with Because of Them We Can, you know, it's bigger than just taking pictures of cute kids. It transcends that, doesn't it? Absolutely. It's really about creating the foundation and then also just reinforcing it on a consistent basis. It's about the unique opportunity that we all have to double down on who we are and to appreciate our unique differences. Now, let's introduce you to Derek Adams, a multidisciplinary artist who explores the African-American experience from his own perspective. This is Derek Adams. And this is his latest exhibition called I Can Show You Better Than I Can Tell You. Much of Derek's work focuses on a simple theme, enjoying the ordinary moments in life. One of the phrases that come up a lot in my work is this idea of black joy. I wanted to offer an alternative way to look at black culture. I did not want to be overshadowed by the traumatic things that are happening to us, around us. So I wanted to bring in another conversation for the future generation to look at. This idea that rest and leisure are their own forms of power and their own forms of resistance. I think the images that he creates are incredibly necessary in filling out uh, the picture of Black people uh, in this world. That power and beauty are also found in Derek's 2015 floater series. The floaty represented the idea of ease or relaxation to be seen in a a way that is not necessarily in action or responding to something or, you know, or pushing against something. But that moment in between, it was chill mode, you know, and chill mode is a good mode to be in. Motion Pictures influenced his latest collection, showing now at the Flag Art Foundation in Chelsea. The series, which is called Motion Picture Paintings, 
Some are direct references to movies. Some are just my imagination kind of fueled by cinema. A New Yorker since 1993, Derek operates out of a studio in Brooklyn. But a piece of him remains in his hometown of Baltimore, where he's supporting a community of emerging artists. I see myself and a lot of the artists that live there. I'm in the process of opening a residency in Baltimore, as well as a couple of other nonprofit programs. New York has this ability to motivate you in a particular way. So bringing some of that experience and some of the possibilities that could happen in Baltimore to the city has been like my dream right now. Derek's art lives beyond gallery walls. He created an installation for Penn Station, bringing the beauty of the outdoors to the busy travel hub. And his mermaids add a mystical feel to the walls of Have and Mar, a new restaurant by world-renowned chef Marcus Samuelson. Derek started as a student in Chelsea 25 years ago. Now I come back and be a creative partner in the restaurant uh, down the street. You know, I just thought that was fitting, but also the beauty in his work. You know, we're just watching the beginning of the artistry of Derek Adams. Derek says he rarely revisits his work once it's finished. Instead, focuses on what he can create next. The art world can't get enough. He really occupies, I think, a really special place. He just continues to refine his work and take it in different directions. And it's really, really great to see him arrive. As for Derek, he continues to create his own narrative, one that focuses on the beauty of contrast. I think that we're at a place, I'm hoping, that difference does not mean superior or inferior. It means different. And I think what I'm trying to represent is something that is not different for me, is normal, but I'm trying to normalize the idea of difference. Still ahead on the boost, an exclusive look at a special makeover for a beloved Marvel comic book character. We'll have that for you right after this. back here on the booth celebrating black heritage today. One woman is reimagining a beloved Marvel comic book character, the Black Panther. Check out this Today exclusive. Hi, I'm Eve Ewing. I'm an author, a professor, and I'm the next writer of the Black Panther comic book series. Coming soon, Marvel will release the next chapter in the Black Panther saga. And for the first time, a black woman writes the world of Wakanda. It's pretty much a really big deal. So I just, uh, I didn't think it's something that would ever happen to me, um, taking on really any Avenger, like a kind of big marquee character like this. The 36-year-old Chicago native always had a love of comic books. 
My mom bought me my first comic book when I was five years old. I was definitely the kid who got my comics taken away and confiscated by the teacher, and I never wanted to be that teacher. If you love something, if this is a story that makes you excited, that makes you want to read, go for it. Once a middle school grade teacher, Eve is now an associate professor at the University of Chicago, but that's just one of her many jobs. Her four book titles cross varying genres, with black girls often at the center of the story. I write poetry, I write nonfiction, I write fiction, I write comic books. At the fundamental level, all of these are really just different forms of storytelling. In 2018, Eve became the fifth black woman in the over eight decade history of the company to write for Marvel. Never in a million years did I think I'd be able to walk over to a rack and see something that has my name on it. Her comic book works include Photon with Monica Rambo, Marvel's Youngest Heroes and Champions Outlawed, and Ironheart with Riri Williams, a genius black superhero from Chicago. Representation matters. It matters to have the characters that represent all the different faces that we see in the world around us. And the first Black Panther, written by a black woman, hit shelves this June. It doesn't make me super proud to be the first black woman to do anything in the 21st century, right? It doesn't mean that you were the first person worthy of that responsibility. It means you were the first person who got a shot. It's exciting and it feels monumental, but my job is to think about how I support the next person and the next person and the next person. The massive impact of Black Panther is not something Eve takes lightly. He's one of the most important, if not the most important, you know, black pop culture icon of my generation um, in terms of fictional characters, right? That's pretty cool. And with much anticipation, Eve reveals Black Panther's newest look exclusively to us. I am so excited for people to see this character design. T'Challa is going to be looking really different. It's much more edgy and kind of homespun. It's not so sleek and slick, not giving too much away from the story. He's trying not to be seen. He is kind of working incognito. As for Wakanda's future? I'm dancing the spoiler dance. What I can say, honestly, is that we will be seeing Wakanda in a way that we have not seen it ever before. Eve even giving us an exclusive first look at June's cover designed by cover artist Torin Clark. Working with an artist is it's just the professional version of the game you play on the bus when you're 14 or 15 of like, hey, what would happen if this hero did this? And what if they went here? And if this fight happened, you know, how would it turn out? I just get paid to do that with other nerds. <laughs> it's pretty fun. And for Eve Ewing's superpower? If I had superpowers, I wouldn't tell you. So you don't know. We'd call it storytelling. I'm proud to tell stories that, you know, you buy for a few bucks every month on, you know, not super high quality paper that's literally stapled together with staples, you know? Like that is, that's a accessible and fun form of storytelling that people all over the world can take part in. Turning now to a film composer who received the opportunity of a lifetime after just one phone call from famed film director Jordan Peele. Here's how he is now paying it forward. Composer Michael Abels is the mastermind behind some of Hollywood's most stirring movie soundtracks. But Abel's big leap from the keys to the screens started with an unexpected phone call from a stranger who would change his life. He said, you know, I want the African-American voice both literally and metaphorically in this film. The film was the 2017 box office hit Get Out. And the stranger on the other end of the line, renowned filmmaker Jordan Peele. Of course, I thought I was being punked, but I thought, I thought it was a really good, it was a really good punk. So I was like, sure, sure, send me the script. Abels, who up until then was posting his music on YouTube, accepted the challenge, crafting music for one of the hottest directors in Hollywood. He said, it's gotta be really scary. I said, well, I think you're talking about gospel horror. The result, spectacular. It's really such a remarkable story on, on so many levels that he would reach out blind and, and you would be open to working with a complete stranger. Jordan is someone who's not afraid to look outside his immediate network for people who he thinks he can see a possibility in. And I can count myself among those. The success of Get Out kicked the door wide open for Abel's composing music for Peel's follow-up film, Us, and HBO's Bad Education, starring Hugh Jackman. Abel's is biracial and grew up in South Dakota and Arizona, 
with what he calls the white side of his family, but knew little about his black side. I was very used to being, you know, the darkest face in the room, but I was not as comfortable being the lightest face in the room. I had to learn how to do that. When I got to college, I sang in a choir at a black church for a while, and it was because I was using music, something that I felt comfortable with, to discover my black identity. Abel's is now in a unique position to tackle the film scoring industry's lack of diversity. Why don't you think that there are more people of color doing what you do, composing music? Craig, I think that the shortest answer is access. First of all, access to education, but also there's access to opportunity. So to help with that, I co-founded the Composers Diversity Collective. The group connects composers of color with content creators. It's not only just good for the soul, but good for box office and good for creativity. <laughs> Abel's credits Grammy-winning songwriter and opera singer Rhiannon Giddens for inspiring him with her remarkable ability to reframe African-American history through music. Tell me about Rhiannon Giddens and, and how she has come um, to inspire you. In writing her songs, she uses it to help recover our history. She tells stories about the Black experience that people may not know about. And so when she asked me to collaborate on writing an opera, I said, absolutely, and I couldn't wait to do it. Their shared passion for Black storytelling is what brought the two artists together for the first time. They collaborated on the opera, Omar, based on the autobiography of an enslaved man. I feel so lucky to have reached out to him um, and, and, and just invited him onto this project. All of the stories that I want to tell about African-American history, or American history, as I like to say, it's a big piece of why Michael and I work so well together. Two artists now making the past part of the present by using music to do what it does, open hearts and minds. The more that we know about the past, the more we can understand about what's going on now. And for me, that tool is music. We all love music, and we all know what great music is, and no one's gonna tell us different. We're back with one last feel-good boost. Sure to, sure to stick with you all day, trust me. An incredible display of unity and love yesterday. This happened at a professional soccer match in Istanbul, Turkey. The game was paused after four minutes and 17 seconds to allow fans to throw thousands of stuffed toys wow. on the field. 4.17, 4 4.17 a.m. That is when the devastating earthquake first struck back on February 6th. It was just a stunning image as the toys came raining down from oh, every wow. part of the stadium. All of those plush toys will be donated to the tens of thousands of children from Turkey and Syria wow. who have been impacted mm. by the quake. Thank you so much for joining us for this special edition of The Boost. Up next, we continue our celebration of black heritage and black culture with Chanel Jones spotlighting trailblazers and leaders in the black community. Stick with us right here on Today All Day.
Hello, I'm Chanel Jones and welcome to our special Discover Black Heritage. We are spotlighting trailblazers and leaders in the black community, starting with a sheriff who just made history. After decades of working in law enforcement, Dewana Witt is now Minnesota's first black female sheriff. Here's NBC's Blaine Alexander with more. Inside the Hennepin County Jail, Nate Johnson's free riders class has a special guest. This isn't the end of the line for you. Sheriff Dewana Witt. A few weeks on the job, it's not unusual to see her here, but what might surprise you is what she says. I was that person who was afraid of the police, saw my brother's butt get kicked many times by the police. It's why she says she never expected to find herself in a uniform. What led you to law enforcement? You know, I used to tell people it was an accident. I do tell people this is my purpose. Cindy? If there is a conventional path to law enforcement, Sheriff Witt is far from it. Growing up in South Minneapolis with her four siblings, drugs and violence were always nearby. By age 15, Dewana was a mother. I saw myself as a statistic. As a teenage mother? Um, as a teenage mother, as someone growing up in poverty. My mother had a drug addiction. My father was an alcoholic. And with that environment came a very early mistrust of police. A man was shot. He was shot by the police, actually. And I could have been all of four or five years old. But 24 years ago, something changed when Sheriff Witt, then working for a nonprofit, happened to take a tour of the jail. At the end of that tour, they talked about how they needed women in the field and women of color. She applied on a whim and got hired as a detention deputy. That's when her views started to shift. I started having more encounters with law enforcement, men and women, and getting to know them as individuals. You know, my barriers that I had, they were falling. Over the next two decades, she worked her way up through the ranks. Then in January, according to the law and the best of my ability, Sheriff Dewana Witt became the first woman to lead her department and the first black female sheriff in the state of Minnesota. A milestone that's all the more meaningful when you consider where she is. Black Hennepin County, the very county where George Floyd was killed. The street where he died was just a block away from the community center where Sheriff Witt grew up. You watched that video along with the rest of the world. Yes. The big difference, of course, is that you were watching it happen in your own community. That was probably one of the most difficult times of my entire life. It ruined a lot of things that had been done to make this profession better and to bridge the gap within communities. She says the hits came from all sides. People would look at me as a black woman, as a black person in a uniform, like, what are you doing? You know, being called names from traitors to Auntie Tammy instead of Uncle Tom. These were fellow black people that yeah, would look yeah. at you and wonder why you were in law enforcement. Yeah, it's like, you know, you're on the wrong side. And that's, I'm sorry, I can never say, talk about this without getting a little choked up. Yeah. But if people would have just known the story of like what it takes to do this job as a black person and to have people say those things to you, it was, it was hurtful. Despite it all, she says she never thought about leaving the job. I knew that I needed to be a person who could interpret, if you will, what people were seeing because everybody couldn't understand that. For Sheriff Witt, then a major, that meant talking to people, protesters, face to face, even when other officers warned her not to, a step toward building trust. That we had a sense of safety and security. Last November, one of her very first visits after winning the election was the jail. And as she walked among the inmates, Sheriff Witt got a big surprise. People were standing up and applauded me. When you and they're in. like, that's our sheriff, y'all. You know, I realized that I'm a symbol of hope for some people and a hope for change. So I got a lot to live up to, but I'm, I'm ready for it. Now to another trailblazer who's breaking barriers. Charlie Mitchell is the first black chef in New York City's history and only the second black chef in the country to earn a prestigious Michelin star. Craig Melvin stopped by his restaurant, Clover Hill in Brooklyn, to discuss his groundbreaking achievement.
The chef behind this popular Brooklyn restaurant is now being celebrated for more than fine dining. Charlie Mitchell is the first black chef in New York City to be awarded a Michelin star and just the second black executive chef in the country to achieve that honor. I wanted to always, you know, plant my feet here and be a serious New York City chef, so that was always a goal of mine. And look at you now. Yeah. <laughs> Dreams come true. Yeah. Mitchell was born and raised in Detroit and developed a passion for food and cooking from his grandmother. I think the thing that stuck with me the most is like she used to like this like whole fry fish, like whole fry bass all the time when I was younger, and I think that stood out the most. Head on? Always. Oh. <laughs> he attended culinary school for a few months, but preferred on-the-job training instead. I ended up like Googling restaurants in the metro area, got my first real job, and in that kitchen is where I was like, wow, like I love the way they work. I love how professional it is. Like I'm using ingredients I've never had, never learned about. Years of experience in world-class restaurants like 11 Madison Park eventually led him to this quiet street in Brooklyn Heights. When Clover Hill opened one year ago, he became its executive chef in charge of creating the menu. Mitchell's team plates an eight-course tasting menu that regularly changes with the best seasonal foods available. I guess it's challenging, but we're always changing something, or we're always trying to make the dish the best version of itself, right? So we may tweak it every day for two weeks straight if we have to, to get it to be like a perfect dish. That quest for perfection did not go unnoticed. When Michelin announced it starred restaurants in October, not only did Clover Hill earn a star in its first year, but Chef Mitchell picked up the award for Best Young Chef. That was a complete surprise when they announced that, and I was just humbled, you know? Were you aware at the time of the historic implications? I was not, not at the time. You always think so many people have come before you, you just assume that someone has already done this, you know? You just, this doesn't cross your mind that you may be the first or second to do really anything. Especially here in New York City. Why do you think that's the case? Why do you think there aren't more people who look like us as executive chefs in fine dining restaurants like this? You don't make a lot of money as a young cook, you know? So I think a lot of times we're like chasing a very different American dream than to kind of put up with these aggressive environments that are often led by people who don't look like us. I tasted some of the iconic dishes that earned this unique place in the food world. I'm gonna come around and try this here, although it's almost too pretty, pretty to touch. <laughs> Including a shark fin flounder and a spicy tapioca. But this is nice, and it's subtle. And a Japanese mackerel. We dry age it, we hang it a little bit, and then we finish it in a little bit of beeswax so that it retains moisture. When people leave your restaurant, what, what do you want them to, to take away? I want them to kind of be, you know, excited or inspired about food, you know? Like, that's something that is very important to us. Up next, Al Roker visits Sesame Street to meet the talented puppeteer blazing a trail in the iconic show. And later, meet the artist on a mission to bring more inclusivity to Hollywood. We'll be right back.
We're back with Discover Black Heritage. My fellow Third Hour co-anchor Al Roker paid a visit to the set of Sesame Street and spoke with a woman making history as the show's first full-time black female puppeteer. As the song goes, can you tell me how to get to Sesame Street? We found out from their newest puppeteer, Megan Pifus Peace, who's been blazing trails just like the show always has. Well, we're here sitting on the stoop at 123 Sesame Street. What are your early memories of, of this program? All of the characters here were my friends. I watched them every day. I had a personal connection with the street. When I was three years old, I had a Sesame Street birthday party. We had a Sesame Street cake and an Elmo walk around character came out and Big Bird. Those friends would help her find her passion. When I was 10 years old, I had just changed to a new elementary school and had to make new friends. I was super shy. I went to a puppetry conference with a few members from my church. I was exposed to women ventriloquists and I saw myself being able to open up just like them and uh, make something come alive in that moment. So I went home, I told my parents I wanted to become a ventriloquist. Megan's mom, checking out VHS tapes from the library for her daughter. And Megan watched them over and over, starting to mimic them. I took my puppets to school and was cracking jokes during lunch break. And my teachers noticed and asked if I would perform in front of the whole school. Mm -hmm. That was my very first performance. And what made me knew in that moment that that's what I wanted to do forever, to hold the attention of kids anywhere from three years old to 12 and make them laugh and smile, that became my joy. That joy continuing as she performed, seeing an opportunity to express herself. So little, you don't go very far. Becoming known as the valedictorian ventriloquist. We all will go far if we are willing. And go far she did, okay. even taking her act on America's Got Talent. A stolen moments oh, wow. is all that we should. After graduating from Vanderbilt with degrees in economics and finance, she spent seven years in commercial real estate until. I found the Instagram page of the performer who does Abby Kadabi, Leslie Carrera Rudolph, and I just fangirled. I said, oh my God, I love your character and what you do with her. She DM'd me and said, you are a gift. What was it like when you first heard from Megan? There was something super warm and heartfelt about it. And so I, I went and I, I, I Googled her and I was blown away. I just felt like it was magic. Mm -hmm. I know that sounds really corny, but I do feel like it was a meeting of the hearts. Leslie was so impressed with Megan's talents, she became her mentor, sharing her material with Sesame's producer who invited Megan to audition. Last September, making history as the street's first full-time black female puppeteer. I immediately entered my the imagination of my childhood. I still wish I could figure out what kind of job I want to do when I grow up and entering the imagination of a lot of kids with six and three quarter year old Gabrielle. What is it like being here on Sesame Street? Oh, it's so much fun. Oh, the weather is always great. It's always sunny. Mm -hmm. You know, you should really consider being a meteorologist here. Megan, hoping her path to the pinnacle of puppetry inspires others. My goal is just to inspire girls to achieve whatever dream they have, mm. no matter their background, their zip code, or no matter the color of their skin. Sesame's executive producer believes representation is important. We want people to be able to see characters on screen and feel like they see themselves. Those friends that inspired her as a child are her best friends today. Who are some of your friends? Tell me about oh, Well, I got lots of friends. Mm -hmm. I got um, Prairie Dog, uh -huh. Abby, mm -hmm. Elmo, mm -hmm. Cookie Monster, mm -hmm. Gonger, mm -hmm. Grover, yeah. uh, Big Bird. Yeah. So nice to meet you, Gabrielle. Oh, it's so nice to meet you too, Mr. Al. High five. Yeah. Woo! 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 Fist boom. 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 Thank you, Al. This year is also the 50th anniversary of hip hop. Craig recently met up with legendary hip hop pioneer Grandmaster Flash and got a sneak peek of the Universal Hip Hop Museum. Take a look. They are a part of music history. Run DMC, Jay Z, Missy Elliott, and the new generation of stars, including 
Kendrick Lamar. Their success built on the shoulders of legends like Grandmaster Flash. He's one of the earliest pioneers of hip hop and a champion of the Universal Hip Hop Museum being built in the Bronx, New York. We met up with him at a temporary exhibition just across from the site of the Future Museum. We're sitting here, you know, just a few feet away from this, this amazing new museum devoted to a genre that you help create. How does that make you feel? Takes me back 50 years. You know, we get a couple of shopping carts and take the speakers and the crates of records and go to the nearest park and just play, you know, and then to, to get here. It's very humbling. Don't push me. Grandmaster Flash and the Furious Five were pioneers of this new form of music in the 70s and 80s and became the first hip hop group inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in 2007. For Flash, it was a dream that started in his childhood home. My biggest sister was playing anything from disco to funk to pop to rock to Latin. You know, so I was really lucky to grow up with this kaleidoscopic view of, of music. Flash would help develop DJing techniques used around the world. Scratching, looping, sampling, innovations that help make hip hop the most popular genre of music. Hip hop, the music, the movement will soon have a new home. A two level universal hip hop museum being built in the Bronx set to open next year. With a 52,000 square foot space with interactive exhibits, a performing space, a radio station and a restaurant. When people come in here, they feel like they're walking into the evolution of, of hip hop history. Rocky Bucano is the museum's executive director. Why is remembering hip hop, the music and the culture. Why is that such an important thing? Well, it's, it's super important because this culture was created by black and brown kids from the projects, from the hood. This culture has saved so many kids' lives by giving them an outlet to become something. The memorabilia throughout the current exhibit is an homage to that struggle and success. Because it's a youth movement. South Africa, South America, no matter where you go, the youth have the same issues. Mm. And it, this music speaks to them. Music that spoke to young kids 50 years ago, inventing the music they needed to find their voices. Do you ever listen to hip hop now and you think, this is not what I intended? I'm happy. I have to be totally, because the way that I see this here is, Something that is loved by so many people has to change. It has to, it has to go through its changes and do different things. Okay. It has to. Otherwise, it's stagnant yeah. and it doesn't grow. But you kind of created it. I didn't say that. You did. <laughs> Coming up, three artists on a mission to bring more inclusivity to Hollywood. Plus, we'll introduce you to a couple making waves in the restaurant industry. We're back right after this.
The 9B Collective is the first black-owned concept art studio ever created, and they've designed looks for major films like Marvel's Black Panther and Guardians of the Galaxy. NBC's Steve Patterson gives us an inside look. We are home. There is a secret weapon in blockbuster films like Black Panther and Wakanda Forever. I am queen of the most powerful nation in the world! and other Marvel productions like Moon Knight and Guardians of the Galaxy. We thank you, Guardians, for putting your lives on the line. Not to mention countless costumes, video games, TV shows, and the other worldly places our favorite characters live in. No matter the vision, it all starts with a digital pen. Michael Wandi and Phil Boutte, along with his childhood friend, actor Aldous Hodge, form the 9B Collective. What's a concept artist? We're the first stab at visuals for what uh, characters or environments or creatures or props or whatever it is can be. And we're basically trying to get things to be approved by a director or producer before they have to go and build every single thing, right? Everything that's designed starts with the drawing first. How many drawings do you do before they're shooting? Many, and many that um, the general public doesn't even get to see. There's a lot of work to figure out who this person is or what they look like or why they're wearing what they're wearing or why they're making these choices, um, you know, visually. Phil helped create costumes for Madonna's three world tours. Mike helped create characters like Ahsoka Tano on the Mandalorian TV series. And they both have been drawn since they were kids, saying they quickly found they were outliers in the industry. I was like, Huh, I don't see anyone else who looks like me doing this. I've been doing, you know, costume and character and stuff like that from 2007. The first time I sat next to another black artist doing my job was 2019. And that was <laughs> and that's even after Black Panther, right? My Ruth Carter was my first black boss. I hope through my example, this means that there is hope. Ruth Carter was the first black woman to win an Oscar in 2019 for her costumes in Black Panther. How difficult is it to sort of change minds? Always the, I'm a glass half full guy, but I'm also a realist and this change needs to happen a little bit faster and that's exactly why we're here trying to do what we do. What is it like for people of color to be doing the job that you do and really just for artists and people in the industry to find work? So it's really rare. And I think also it's another thing that is not really pushed in our culture to have that as a creative outlet. So that's another part of 9B is like showing up to school and informing the students and letting them know that this is a possible and viable option for a career. We notice that often, especially people of color, get hired for what they've done, not for their potential. So we flipped that. We're hiring people for their potential and not just what they've done. They just need a, you know, an opportunity. And the silver lining of the opportunity, Alice says, is a growing community. We get to have a freedom to fully be who we are in our own space, in a safe space, without having to deal with cultural negligence. The 9B artists really do make magic with those pens, turning details about ordinary me into a huge surprise. Who's this? Oh, oh, where are you at? What? <laughs> <laughs> Is that me? Yeah. <laughs> Did you draw that? Look at that. The color came from Earth, but then also from Michigan State. Up here, you have your wife, dog, and cat. Seeing this and hearing what you put into making me, uh, which is weird, it's so weird to look at me right now. <laughs> um, I, I get it, I get it a lot more. Did a really good job. Thanks, Steve. Up next, a couple's incredible story of resilience. Stay tuned for more.
back with a story about a couple making waves in the restaurant industry. Caval and Rhea Graham opened their Caribbean restaurant during the pandemic, and it's now one of the hottest spots in Brooklyn. I recently paid a visit to find out their recipe for success. Caval and Rhea Graham are living a life they never could have imagined. I love hospitality. I never thought that I would have my own restaurant. But as we look back, we kind of see that every step that we took was actually leading us to this moment. Today, they are the parents of three young children and will celebrate five years of marriage. But it's their journey to this point, running Kokomo, a popular pan-Caribbean restaurant with Indian and Asian flavors that combines their passion for food and hospitality. Clearly, you both had some kind of restaurant background. Started off in um, nightlife and then became uh, roving chefs, uh, me and the guys that I had a group with. At the time, I was a marketing manager for a Caribbean restaurant as well. They were soon married and hesitantly decided their next move together would be a restaurant. So they took to social media, documenting everything about acquiring and opening a restaurant. As they were just about to open, the pandemic hit. Against all odds, they officially opened in the summer of 2020. How challenging was it? I would say it was like mental warfare because you really did not know what to expect. But I think because we were so open about our feelings to our social media, people wanted to genuinely support. Something that's very inspirational because Rhea was a part of every step during pregnancy it motivated me to even work harder. The couple describes the menu as elevated Caribbean fare, served up in an atmosphere that feels like the Caribbean. I would say if you're looking for a vibe, come here. We represent all different parts of the Caribbean. We definitely appeal to all ethnicities, you know, whether it's Afro-Caribbean, Latin Caribbean, you know, uh, Asian Caribbean. Did you get inspiration for different recipes? I mean, how did you do it? We were very passionate about like bringing out things that we grew up on, you know, tapping into our Caribbean heritage. Do you feel like you are blazing a trail? Real trailblazers for us are the grandmas, man, because there's nothing like a Caribbean grandma in that kitchen showing her stuff. And now we're just trying to modernize it and just make it into something fresh and new. Some of their hottest Caribbean dishes are on flatbread. The yeah, island pasta flatbread on any given day because it's, uh, it's something that we, we reinvented. And I think everybody comes in and like, they can't get that nowhere else. It's yeah. served with shrimp, oxtail, mm -hmm. chicken. Once we saw that brick oven, we knew we had to do a ode to Brooklyn mm -hmm. by having a brick oven pizza crust. And then we tap on top of it a tomato confit sauteed shrimp with aki, which is the national fruit of Jamaica. I had to give the food a try. So this is our Rasta balls. Okay. Croquette fried Italian Alfredo sauce Ooh. that we infuse with some jerk seasoning. Ooh. Aioli on top. Can I try it? Of course. The flavor's burst in your mouth. Oh my gosh. This alone would have me coming back. As they embrace this family-run business, they reflect on this moment in time. Everything that you need to succeed is within you. We come from very humble beginnings. Our parents struggled. I know how hard, excuse me, <clears throat> I know how hard they worked to leave a path for myself and how hard we as parents worked for us to be where we are. I take none of it for granted and you can achieve anything you want as long as you believe in yourself. That's it for our Discover Black Heritage special. Thank you for tuning in and we'll see you next time on Today All Day. Now to our series together, we rise celebrating black culture and contributions. And today we want you to meet Charleston chef Kevin Mitchell. Kevin's been cooking since he was a kid and became the first African-American chef instructor at the Culinary Institute of Charleston at Trident Tech, where he's serving up some Southern comfort. Oh. Take a look. What is that at the bottom of the pan? Fond. Fond. And what is fond? Crispy bits. Crispy bits that come off the... Salmon. It's one thing to know how to put a piece of fish into a pan, but I always tell my students that in order for you to be a really great chef, you have to understand where the food comes from. Kevin Mitchell has become one of Charleston's most distinguished chefs, wearing many hats. 
instructor, culinary historian, and scholar. His passion to preserve Southern ingredients and champion the historical significance of African American culture through food is always present. I've always said that in order for us to understand where we go, we have to understand where we came from. And we always have to understand the people that lay that foundation. Without them, there is no us. Without these enslaved cooks, there is no Chef Kevin Mitchell. I first discovered food in the kitchen of my grandmother's home. At six years old, she started teaching me how to cook. I really believe that she saw something in me and that connection with her in the kitchen led me to, to this path that I've been on. That path has led Mitchell to head up kitchens and restaurants around the country. But his love of Southern food eventually lured him back to the South. Nothing's better than for me to use something that was locally grown in South Carolina. A food does unite people. And depending on the types of conversations you, you're having, it can divide. And what I try to do is bring people together. How great is it to sit around a table and have dialogue with someone centered around a bunch of food? I think it's the greatest thing on the planet. Kevin, what a beautiful <laughs> tribute you. to you. And Thank your you grandmother so got a nice shout out yes. there too. Yes. So Very sure she's sweet. at home crying. But. Oh, <laughs> yes. Talk to us about what you're going to cook for us today. All right, so I'm going to do a dish that I call peas and greens, where mm -hmm. I'm bringing together black eyed peas and collard greens together mm. in the same pot, mm -hmm. but also adding a couple different ingredients that people may or may not um, associate with, with black eyed peas. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so we start with some black eyed peas that we've soaked overnight. Um, this will help reduce the cooking time. Mm -hmm. So it, then we put them in the pot, a little bit of water, a generous amount of salt, mm -hmm. and, and then I throw in a couple cloves of garlic. You just do whole cloves like that? Yes, yeah. whole cloves mm -hmm. of garlic, some fresh thyme sprigs, and then we bring it to a boil and then turn down the heat and then we let it simmer to about you know, 30, 35 minutes until the peas are um, nice and tender. You don't want to cook them too far because you're going to continue the cooking process when you uh, add some if, of the if other If you don't have time or you forget to soak it, how long is, is um, the cooking time? You can time? still take the peas and soak them in boiling water oh, for oh. about an hour. Oh. Or there are some grocery stores that actually have peas oh, so. already either in the in the can or they already mm -hmm. have them in a plastic container that okay. you can use those as well. So now you're going to make kind of the sauce, right? Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. So we start with some onions that we uh, caramelize and a little bit of oil, mm -hmm. olive oil or um, even coconut oil, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. adds a little bit more coconut flavor mm -hmm. um, with the milk. Mm -hmm. And then what Salt? we do is, yeah, we season it. Okay. Right? And we remember when we're in? cooking. Uh, cooking is adding foundation, so we always okay. season as we add in ingredients, so we can add in our spices. Hot so chili flakes. Hot chili flakes. Should I add these in? Not yet. Okay. okay. And What's then this we're going to do that is a little bit of ground ginger. Mm. Oh yeah. Right. And What's then that? we have some turmeric. Turmeric. Oh, we have a little thing. Is that here. garlic? Chopped garlic. That's, that's some chopped garlic. What's, what's this guy? And that is um, some curry powder. Curry. Yeah. And we cook okay. that down and we cook it until it becomes fragrant, which mm -hmm. basically means you can start to smell the mm -hmm. spices mm -hmm. cook. You want to do that with dry spices because you want to bring out that yeah. that flavor. Yes. Right? And once you get that flavor in there, then you can start adding some of like your wet tomatoes. ingredients. Right. Yeah. So you can add in what your your wet ingredients. This is the reserve cooking liquid from the peas, oh. which actually adds a little bit more of the pea flavor. Then it is also cream. That's coconut milk. Coconut milk. Right? So and this is add, the whole coconut do you extract a again. Before I put that in there, <laughs> she loves coconut. We I have some uh, coconut milk. And we have our um, okay. vegetable stock. You can use chicken stock or okay. water. And you cook this down until it starts to thicken, and that's what that uh, pea liquid does ah. because it has a lot of starch from the peas in that. Okay. Yeah. Then of course it'll cook down with the tomatoes and it'll actually thicken it as well. Does this then, go in there? Or yes. No? Then we do. I do the peas that after, have been cooked. Yeah, after they that go cooks. In, okay. go in here. Come, let's try it. And then. I'm going to pour these yeah, two. Go right ahead. And then we add the greens um, long there enough so the, the residual heat from the from the pan just cooks the greens. You don't want to overcook them. You want to make sure they continue to stay and green. And then you just grill a piece of salmon and put it right on top? <clears throat> yeah. So we have mm. a piece of salmon that we've created a blackening spice. Mm. So it's got some um, cayenne. Mm. There's some paprika. Mm. This is delicious. Thank you so much. It's a little oh heat. Thank you so much. It has mm. got a little bit of heat to it from the... From the mm. um, 
Chili pepper. From the chili pepper. Kevin. And also that curry actually it's adds a little bit so of heat, too. so good. Thank you so much. I bet Thank your you. grandma's super proud. Oh, she is. To get the recipe, head to today's slash, uh, today.com slash food. Kevin's going to be hosting the Roots of Rice. It's at the Charleston uh, Wine and Food Festival. And he March has a beautiful fifth. cookbook, the book too. It's a gorgeous. What's the name of your cookbook? It's called Taste the State, South Carolina's mm. Signature Foods, their uh, recipes, and their stories. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Kevin, it's, this is too good. <laughs> And we are back with today's food. This morning's guest, Kwame Onwachi, a James Beard Award winner. You may have seen him as both a contestant and recurring judge on Top Chef. He's also, by the way, opened five restaurants, all before turning 30. And now he's out with a follow-up to his acclaimed memoir. It actually is his first cookbook. It's fantastic. It's called My America, Recipes from a Young Black Chef. Kwame, so good to see you. Man, I'm, I'm so curious about how you, in this book, have taken your whole history, like from Nigeria to mm -hmm. the Caribbean to Louisiana to the Bronx, and how have this book has been just basically your lifeline. For sure. You know, it's my version of what... I found American cuisine as a kid. When you're a kid, you're not asking like, what ethnicity is this when you're eating food? You right. know, I know I'm in America and I'm eating something. So that was American food to me. So it shows a lexicon of how diverse American What do you remember is. about being in little Jamaica in the Bronx eating food that you're about to make for us today? Jerk chicken. I remember sitting on the side of the road with my father, getting jerk chicken out of a barrel um, and getting sauce all over my face. What is jerk sauce? What is jerk? So uh, jerk sauce, you know, it started as an act of like preservation, but it's a, it's a sauce that has so many different layers of flavor. Um, it, it starts with a marinade, yeah. and you marinate this, this chicken or pork or, or vegetables in this sauce, and then it's smoked and let's grilled. Get, let's get to it. So the, the jerk it sauce, I always recommend making this from scratch. So I have a pepper sauce here. It's mm -hmm. pretty much a scotch bonnet puree. Um, we have thyme. We have... Um, a little bit of tamarind, we have scallion, ginger, garlic, and soy sauce, and then allspice, cinnamon, and bay leaf and clove. We're gonna put that in the blender, act yep. like this blender's yep. going. Yeah, no need to do that. <laughs> well, then the, the sauce comes out like this, so I Is like Is it to in make, like the barbecue sauce family? Is um, it? No, but you can make a barbecue sauce, which we're gonna do now. Okay. So we have ginger and garlic and onion sweating. You know, you add some ketchup to this, you add some brown sugar, and then you add your jerk paste, and then you let this simmer for about 30 minutes until it gets nice, deep, and dark like this. I was saying when I went to uh, spring break on MTV, we flew into Montego Bay, and there was, the weather was so bad, I had to drive to the grill, and uh, we stopped on the street along yeah. the way, and I had my first jerk chicken. It's like a culinary thing I'll never forget. Your first real jerk chicken, Is it a right? street food? Is yeah, it's actually, it's actually a street food. Um, there's a lot of history in it, and that's the beautiful thing about My America. It gets into the history of the dishes and why they stood the test of time. Perfect. So you got your jerk barbecue. You can blend it if you want um, to make it smooth. I like mine a little bit chunky. The difference between my jerk chicken recipe is I like to brine the chicken. Yep. I like to infuse the flavor deep into it. So like I have an overnight brine sort of thing? Overnight brine. Uh, you have your flavors of your jerk uh, paste in the brine as mm -hmm. well. Mm -hmm. And then you'll marinate it, 
throw it on the grill. I love it. We're in the studio. You like to outside cook this, though. Yeah, because you got to add some smoke to it, you know. What kind uh, of wood chips do you like? I like to use pimento wood. The wow, wood never comes, heard of that. that. That, you know, grows the allspice berries, right. so you accentuate those flavors. Let's see our little chefs over there. What do you think of the jerk chicken? Our plates are almost empty. Are you no. serious? I don't, now you don't. <coughs> Come on. We, we, we got oh plenty. My God. Oh, my right. God. We need more. You know what's interesting? A lot of times jerk chicken, it's just it's too wet. There's too much jerk sauce. Yours is perfect mm -hmm. because just a little bit, mm -hmm. and it gives you that hit. You know? well, so good. It, when you do it properly, like it's such a refined dish. You know. What is doing it properly? What are the cooking tips on the chicken? How does it differ? You from gotta, the you gotta smoke it. You know, you gotta cook it in the grill. You gotta let it marinate. You gotta make your jerk seasoning from from scratch, mm -hmm. and that's how you build those layers of flavor. Mm -hmm. Is this well, what you're going to make it? You got, but we have to plug the family reunion because it's so Yeah, cool. the Just family reunion. say what it is, everybody. So the family reunion is this, uh, you know, four-day food festival at the Salamander Resort and Spa. We get some of the best chefs together in the Ooh. country and food professionals mm. and, and entertainers as well. So um, it's it's really exciting. Tickets drop today, everybody. Of course they I want to see all of you oh at the God. family reunion. <laughs> what is the side dish, by the way? The side dish is sautéed uh, cabbage and carrots. Oh my God! How's that, guys? Good. I mean, are you kidding That's me? Amazing. You know what we need? We need rum punch. <laughs> a little rum oh, punch. I got. Well, <laughs> well congratulations on everything, man. Thank Looking you. forward to Thank the you. family reunion. The book is beautiful too. Yeah, so much. Uh, great writing, great recipes, and this looks delicious. So there's a good lesson on jerk chicken. Kwame, thank you. That recipe, Yum. by the way, is on our website today.com/food. And for the cookbook, check out today.com/shop. It is awesome. Our friend and star of Food Network's delicious Miss Brown. Cartier Brown cooking up cornbread. Hey, Hello. Hello. South Carolina's finest. Absolutely. Charleston. Charleston, South they Carolina. They know cornbread right. in Charleston. That's, that's what we do here. Okay, so I'm making a jalapeno cheddar honey cornbread. Wow. So it's a lot of flavor. Okay? Hold on, uh, Chanel's got a joke about the jalapeno. What you got? Oh, shoot. You put me on the spot. <laughs> um... Never mind. I don't Never mind. It's, it's okay. <laughs> put it, put it it was, you okay. don't want to get it. You, you can't be all jalapeno in my business. No, it's oh. Your face. Uh, yeah. <laughs> that is something. Yeah, that's okay, okay, you put me on the spot. <laughs> you take the seeds out. Take the seeds out, okay. dice it up. What you're going to end Always up with is out. these right here, these little cute little cubes right here. So you're going to just dump it right into the wet ingredients, okay? Mm. And what, so is that, what do we have there? So that's buttermilk and milk, okay? Buttermilk mm. and milk, 50 50. So 50 50, all right? Got some green onions, mm. got some sharp cheddar cheese, mm. all right? So it's cheddar, honey, and jalapenos, okay? okay? You got two eggs. And just a little bit of butter. And just a little bit. <laughs> a whole lot it. of butter. I love it. That's, why it's so That's good. about two sticks of butter, okay? All right. All right. So whisk that up. Once you whisk it up, you're going to pour it right in here. Now, I'm also doing half and half, half cornmeal, half flour, all right? Why is that? It gives it more of a, see, I like a very cakey cake type mm -hmm. of cornbread. Because, uh -huh. you know, we grew up in the South, we yeah. eat like a very crumbly cornbread. Mm -hmm. You don't really want, I like a more cakey, more sweet now, cornbread. Do you, do you have like a baking powder in there, or is this a self rising Okay, so no, this is, I have baking soda, uh -huh. salt, and garlic powder, uh, all right? Okay. So super flavorful, all mm -hmm. right? Whisk that up, you want to pour it into your hot cast iron skillet. I love a good cast iron oh, yeah. skillet. You're going to get this nice crispy crust, and mm -hmm. what you're going to get is this right here. It's topped with cheddar cheese, more jalapenos, so and good. butter. You know Perfect. what I was saying to you? It's so, the combination is so good because it's not too spicy, your jalapeno. Right, right. Because the honey The honey it. balances all out, okay? Really so you got some leftover. We got leftover, yes. we got leftover cornbread right. here, all right? So what I'm going to do is make cornbread croutons. Ooh. Yes, so we're going to make it into like one oh, inch good. cube. Uh -huh. Oh, the cheese on top. That's, that's. Uh-huh. So you get Next a little level. cheesy cornbread. Mm -hmm. So what you got here, uh-oh, we lost the cornbread. Oh, make one Five inch seconds. squares here, mm -hmm. okay? You're going to so dump good. into a bowl. All right. Toss it with a little bit of uh, olive oil. Yeah. Okay. Salt, pepper. Mm -hmm. Toss it around, put it on parchment paper, bake, bake it until it's it. nice and crispy. What all right. Great idea. And now you're gonna use Got a this? bowl of romaine here. Romaine mm -hmm. rotisserie chicken. You can use fried chicken if so you want. Whatever. Okay, we're gonna add in some shaved parm. Mm hmm Make it a mess. Some bacon. Right. Everything's better with bacon. Of course. Uh -huh. it is. <laughs> and Ooh. your crispy croutons, mm -hmm. all right? And you got your Caesar dressing. Caesar here. dressing here, homemade. Toss it up. Made with a little bit of uh, Dijon mustard, some mayo. Phenomenal. Toss it up. Put it in a the bowl there, serve it over some Parmesan. That's terrific. And since Delicious. this is Make Ahead Monday, we're doing it three different we're gonna ways. Do, now we got breakfast. You got dinner, lunch, breakfast, okay. all right? So we got some uh, the leftover cornbread here in a bowl, mm -hmm. all right? To right. so that bowl, we're going to add eggs. Yes. Okay. Country sausage. Mm. Country sausage. Uh -huh. That's in the that, That's pork. Not pork, but pork. <laughs> <laughs> oh, More green onion. Boom. All right. And some so milk because it, it has to be oh. nice and wet and moist, okay? Mm -hmm. Oh, my God. You get that fully incorporated. Yeah. 
add that to a, a cast up uh, well uh, a waffle, waffle iron that's sprayed with a little bit of oil mm -hmm. what you're going to get is this oh my gosh beauty right here and hold on not to to, to take it up a notch yeah. a little bit of hot sauce but Ooh. i've also Call made a hot sauce in my bag spicy maple syrup oh, so it's getting. a mixture of hot sauce and maple syrup mm. listen this okay is phenomenal it's, it's everything the combination you... of flavors it really makes it's it sweet it's spicy it's savory it's it's everything i, I mean don't throw away that old cornbread mm -hmm. it's All so right. good thank you. Right, thank, thank, you. you thank you for these recipes <laughs> today.com oh slash food Okay, you know that in that moment, Hoda, where mm -hmm. you take a bite of mm -hmm. something mm -hmm. so delicious mm -hmm. you can actually taste the love that went into it? Well, that is the kind of food that Harlem chef Tammy Treadwell makes, and her cooking is just part of what draws the crowds in. Take a look. That's love. Wait till you taste that. Right in the heart of Harlem in a 15-square-foot food truck. I got four po boys here. Yes, that's me. You'll find po' boys, shrimp and grits, and a whole lot of good vibes. I tell people all the time on my corner, on 125th Street, there's nothing but love. Love and Harlem are two things that are part of Chef Tammy Treadwell's DNA. In this neighborhood that's in every part of who you are. We are sitting in the Harlem Rose Garden. This is like so surreal because I've often said I'm that flower or mm. that rose that will break through the concrete. Mm. No matter what you pour on me, I'm going to emerge stronger and stronger. Throughout Tammy's sometimes challenging life, food has been what she calls her love language. I cannot talk about food without talking about my grandmother because her spirit is with me everywhere I go. I got my love of cooking from hanging around in the kitchen with her, mm. not wanting to go outside because she was cooking and I wanted to be first in line to get the plate. There was a lot of people <laughs> in my house. After surviving cancer and getting laid off from her job, Tammy felt a calling to feed people. I'm taking care of all the flavors. In 2016, she broke through the male-dominated food truck industry and opened Harlem Seafood Soul. The idea that you had, like, all the things you had to overcome in your life. At your core, are you an optimist? Unbelievably. We live in a world of possibilities. I'll show you it can be done. Then in March of 2020, the unthinkable happened. Tammy was forced to shut her truck down. Then her husband, Greg, passed away from COVID. What did you lose that day? I lost my best friend. We had 38 amazing years mm -hmm. together. One thing I know for sure is that man loved me. I have never had a doubt that his love is real. There's a period 
in between fetal position mm -hmm. and standing up. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. And there's mm -hmm. something that happens in that moment where it changes. What made you say, it's time to get out from under these covers? Mm -hmm. I started seeing the faces of the people in my family. They were looking at me for the first time like they were very concerned. Every time I would hit a wall emotionally, or I felt like, you know, I'm, today I, today's not the day, I'm gonna lay back down today. Mm -hmm. And my granddaughter would say to me, Grandma, mm -hmm. when you going to cook for the people again? This time <laughs> I looked at her like, hmm. you know, that's a good question. You know what we love about you is that you're not only sharing your love through your food, you're also sharing your love through helping others. Mm -hmm. That was the only motivation I had to cook, was to do something for someone else. I had to put my grief on the mm. side and move forward. Mm. And that's what I did. When, when the doors opened, mm -hmm. and did you wonder, are they gonna remember me? Yeah, I stood there for a little while like, Okay, I know y'all smell me. <laughs> and I literally turned around um, to, I guess, stir the grits or do something. And when I turned back around, there was a line. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It was a line. And there had to be, you know, at least a dozen people standing yes. in line. And they were waiting for me. <laughs> and they were smiling. And they were like, where you been? Oh. And we're glad to see you back here. Harlem is a village. That's how I was always raised to believe. There's a lot of love in this life. Mm. Just wait till you get the experience. We, let's go. All right. Yes, let's go. Today, just shy of 60 and after a lifetime of hardship, Chef Tammy says she's in her prime and she'll remain on that corner as long as the community allows her to stay. Jenna, I'm going to give you a little bit. Thank you. Be okay, careful. ready? I have worked so hard for so many years and now I get to do what makes me happy. This morning on Today Food, a delicious way to celebrate back black history as part of our special series, Together We Rise. Joining us now is Bryant Terry. He's a James Beard and NAACP Image Award-winning vegan chef, food justice activist, and author. His latest book is called, and it is terrific, mm. Black Food, Stories, <laughs> Art, and Recipes from Across the African Diaspora. Mm, that's right. This morning, uh, he's sharing a new take on two classic cuisines. Chef Brian, good morning to you. Good morning. Hey, Chef. Good morning, guys. Chef. Thank you so much for having me on today. Absolutely. Even the book is even just beautiful, quite frankly, yeah. uh, to have in, in the house. Let's let's dig in. What are we starting with? So we are going to start with one of the recipes in this book by brilliant national based chef Charles Hunter III, and they're called lace hoe cakes. You might be wondering, well, what is it? How, what's that name about? 
And actually during the antebellum period, uh, many enslaved Africans would actually take the metal part from the hoe that would be used in the fields and you could remove it, put it over an open fire, they would put a little fat on there and then people could have this mixture of cornmeal, some water and actually fry it on the, um, the, the metal part of the hoe and you have these delicious flat cakes. So Ooh, that's, yeah. that's the inspiration. You know, this is something that's ubiquitous in a lot of African American cooking. Um, Johnny cakes is one of the other terms, or, which is thought to be a corruption of journey cakes because they traveled well. Mm-hmm. You can have them easily when you're out and about. So should I get started? Yeah, yeah. do it. Do it. Do it. All right. So um, let me just say this. If you have corn, if we were in the summertime, we'd actually add fresh corn to this recipe. Mm-hmm. But because we're in the dead of winter and we don't have any, we're going to omit the corn and just use the uh, cornmeal mixture as the, the primary flavor. We have some onions that have been sauteed until they're translucent. I am going to add a little black pepper, a little bit of salt, and then some garlic, mm. right? So that's going to add, um, you know, those alliums is really going to add a lot of flavor to this. If you could boil a pot of water, you can make this recipe. That is how simple it is. So let me tell you the, the, the ingredients. We have some cornmeal. We have a lightly beaten egg, some um, buttermilk, and then a little butter. And through the magic of uh, TV, okay. we have everything already combined. Okay. So once everything is combined, we simply want to uh, give it a good stir. And, you know, you don't want to over stir it. You want to stir, stir it until it's just mixed. We can actually add everything in this pot uh-huh. in here. And um, yeah, it's simply a matter of cooking the cakes after that. So the thing I say is, you know, this is slow and low, kind of like, you know, barbecue. You want to cook these slowly mm-hmm. and, and, and not too much because you don't want the outside to be cooked. And then you have this kind of cakey inside. Mm-hmm. So once this is cooked, we want to put the heat on, I don't know, medium heat. Uh, medium high, and then we simply look at that. Take a scooper, uh huh, and then we can oh, add this come on. to our pan. Let me let, let me just come show on. you guys. Let's what's see, going let's on see. In there. <laughs> so um, the thing is, obviously, you don't want to overcrowd the pan. You right. know, I typically will do a couple of the um, cakes at a time. Mm-hmm. Once they're done, what I like to do is keep the oven on low heat and just kind of store uh, the cakes in there as I'm cooking so that once everything is cooked, oh, they're actually yum. Be And then how do you, do you serve them just like that? Oh, no. We got to put a little so, uh What we're going to do is uh, uh, for this one, we're doing a molasses butter. Right? Oh. So we have, <laughs> I know you guys like butter. <laughs> so we have, our, we have our butter here. I am going to add some um, molasses. And, mm. you know, like I said, this is, this is a pretty simple recipe. Once everything's added, you simply want to mix it up. Hmm. I'll have some molasses then, butter. <laughs> Yum. Da, 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 da. Okay. Let's see, let's see. see. That's oh. Oh. These are our finished it. cake. Now, oh. um, Ch- Charles Hunter suggests that we uh, give it a little garnish with some smoked paprika Ooh. and yeah, some green sweet. onions sure. and oh, like this. Goodness, yeah. and now, are we serving this for breakfast? Dish. Are we serving this for lunch? Yeah, when are we serving it's, this? It's, so the beautiful thing about these is that they can pivot easily from a breakfast treat to a snack to a dinner treat, right? So you can have them with maple syrup. But what we're doing with these is I actually prepared um, these slow braised mustard greens. So, you know, dark leafy greens are one of the staple ingredients throughout um, a lot of Western Central Africa. You know, pretty much all over the African diaspora, you're going to find dark leafy greens, but definitely in the South. What I did in this, I cooked the greens, and this is beautiful um, broth. I know you not you guys know about this. It's called the pot liquor, right? Oh yes. Uh-huh. Here we go. Just have a couple All seconds, the, Jeff. <laughs> okay. So look, we're gonna add some um, caramelized onions mm, in here mm, with mm, the tomatoes. Mm. We're gonna um, sprinkle it with some jalapeno oh, and a little bit of this yeah. hot pepper vinegar. Oh, All right. Next time, oh, bring it in. Oh, 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 Jeff Bryant, Terry, it. Terry it looks fantastic. For the yeah. recipes, by the way, go Thank to chef.com slash food. And for the book, Black Food, check out today.com slash shop. Thank you.
Welcome to The Boost. I'm Chanel Jones filling in for Hoda today. March is Women's History Month, and today we are all about girl power and inspirational stories of female entrepreneurs. But to start, one woman's hobby, helping reunite people with cherished family heirlooms. See how she's working to make sure no photo gets left behind. Special education teacher Kate Kelly moonlights as a detective. These are the ones, the unsolved mysteries. Unsolved mysteries, yes. Solving cases rarely as black and white as they appear. I would say this was mm, 1880s maybe, if I were to just roughly guess. Kelly's sleuthing starts with a vintage photo rescued from an antique shop. Ooh, this one's cool, look at this. Horse. Oh yeah, look at that. 50% off. <laughs> Just a small inscription gives her investigation a lead. <gasps> Look at this one. That's a good one. That's fantastic. Keeper pile. And when a case is closed, a once orphaned image returns to a loving home. Would you say this process is addictive? Absolutely. It's 100% addictive. The passion project started about a year ago, but Kelly's love of genealogy has been alive since her childhood, well before the advent of websites like Ancestry.com that now help her identify anonymous faces from times long ago. I can't let them live in a dusty box in an antique store, so they come home with me and I do my best to connect them with relatives. By day in Plainville, Massachusetts, she's teaching. But for several hours a night, Kelly is learning the story behind each photo to find a living connection. It was my dad's senior picture with his identical twin. When Kate Griffin heard from Kelly about this photo in February, it had been just three weeks since her beloved father had passed away. I told her I was my eyes were filled with tears and joy, and she has had no idea how much that meant to me because I'd never, never seen that before. Anecdotes like this one earned Kelly a title, the photo angel. She shares her search stories on Facebook, collecting more than 9,000 followers. By her count, Kelly has mailed the unkept keepsakes to 42 states and five countries. This picture of young Ethel Weiss now heading home. She's buried in Arlington, Virginia, but her picture will soon be in the care of her 93-year-old husband. And this of Simeon Staples, headed to family in Rhode Island, a shovel shop worker in the late 1800s. Kelly pays out of pocket for the photos and the postage. She says her payment comes another way. It's just, it's an overwhelming feeling of joy and it's what keeps me going. The labor of love has to express yes. Yes. The, a message here and your message would be? My message would be preserve the past. Um, just you don't know who you are until you know who you, your ancestors are. And sometimes when it seems the past is lost, it may just be taking a long way home. Katie Beck, Attleboro, Massachusetts. From preserving the past to working towards the future. Next up, four women who were brought together by divorce and now have an entirely new kind of family. See why they are encouraging everyone to burn the rule book of life. At any given moment, I have people I can talk to, laugh with. We do a lot of laughing. Karen Hopper, Leandra Nicola, Holly Harper, and Jen Jacobs all say they found their dream home here in Tacoma Park, Maryland. But for them, it's not just about location. It's about living together, kids and all. They go out and practice their flips on the trampoline, and it's just the most fun. The idea for this full house came from Holly and Heron, close friends who went through divorces at the same time. Holly and I really just said, why not? We were in individual apartments. We were kind of tired of paying rent and yeah. dealing with the logistics of being single parents. My marriage ended and then I had a like, couple of really significant losses. And then in early 2020, my dad died. Just like my life was burned to the ground. Yeah. And so, I could turn to Heron and say, "We, ha I have, I literally have nothing left. Let's just yeah. do this." They started searching, finding the perfect house on day one, and closing in June of 2020. They just needed more people to share it with. I posted in the neighborhood listserv, "Hey, two single moms bought this house. You know, we have a basement unit for rent." Leandra messaged right away and said, "I want in." 
Leandra, tell me about that decision then. Part of just trying to f find a way to like have a stable place to live as a single mom and then had all the perks of like this amazing built-in support system. <laughs> then Holly and Heron's friend, Jen, also moved in. The pandemic had been, what, six months into it and I was just not feeling in a good place and just feeling really cut off. And then finally in October of 2020, that was my decision, like, I, I gotta get out. So how is the place set up? Do you each have your own kitchen and bathrooms? It's a four unit building. Um, so there's a front door and from there you access directly sort of Holly's unit, upstairs is mine, and then on top of mine is Jen's. And then you can go to the basement and access Leandra's. The four split the cost of household expenses and hold monthly meetings to talk business or about any conflicts, which they say are rare. This is probably a loaded question, but for, for those of us who are married, we're like, oh, how does that work? <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes I'll joke with my husband that I need a wife. Like, you know, yeah, I need somebody well, to like, help me. Do. Like, I just need, Come you know, on. <laughs> The simplest example is every Monday night is garbage night yeah. and only probably once a month yeah. do I do it because someone yeah. else has done yeah. it and yeah. it's like, oh my God, I live with women. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, they say it takes a village and you guys actually have created your own village, right? I hang out with their children and they'll hang out with mine. I can just say, hey, I'm going to go for a run and there's always a grown up mm -hmm. on yes. site. They've even given their home a name. Siren House, after the mythical female creature. Siren is a form of sort of feminist power. We're building a community that we sort of have the siren song, so we bring people together. Case in point, Leandra and Jen. They fell in love. <laughs> <laughs> and now they're together. It's, it's true. Wait, is this for real? Like, seriously? Yeah. Yes. So uh, one night they, I was no, hanging no, out. No, 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 no. I'm not the whole thing. Nope. I was just saying one night. Can I go on the record and please have the movie rights to this true life? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Not only that, the women also helped Leandra open a cafe nearby called Main Street Pearl. To be in a place where you can like really trust the people around you who are gonna always have you, it's like that's, I mean, that is something that I didn't know I could ever have, so. Is there anything you want people to know about what you've learned from this experience? You can do whatever you want. Yeah. <laughs> Burn the rule book of life and just look at it differently. I love that you guys are living fearlessly. I think that the big takeaway for me is that there is sort of unconditional love. I could be my worst self, I could be my best self. They see me for who I am and it's all okay. Coming up, one woman's journey proving the grass may actually be greener on the other side when you pursue your passion. Stay with us. Welcome back to The Boost. We are bringing you the story of one woman who broke the mold and the bank to pursue her passion for fashion. And wait until you see how it all paid off. Welcome to Shopo, a fashion brand that prides itself on being playful and professional, just like the company culture. Shopo is an online fashion brand 
that we set out to be your go-to place to shop. We're all about inclusivity, body positivity, and just a lot of great fashion. The business is the brainchild of 35-year-old Jane Liu. Jane, along with her parents Queenie and Frank, immigrated from China to Australia when Jane was just eight years old. We were poor, they worked in factories, they worked as cleaners, leaving behind their corporate jobs so that they can give me this brighter future. After college, Jane worked at some well-known accounting firms. And while it made her parents proud, Jane absolutely hated it. I remember back then looking at my job and just thinking, I can't do another 40 years of this. So in 2010, she took a risk and joined a friend selling clothing at different pop-up stores. She liked it so much that she quit her corporate job, but kept it hidden from her parents, even though she lived with them. For six months, um, getting up early in the morning, putting on my suit every day, packing an empty laptop bag so I didn't have to actually carry a laptop. And I had to get the bus into the city with my mom because she also went in the city. That was the start of the business. Yet that business was over almost as quickly as it began. I was devastated, I was embarrassed, and now I was broke. One month later, Jane maxed out her credit cards to create a second business called Show Pony which would eventually become Showpo. We even had three bricks and mortar stores. And I remember the moment that we decided we're gonna close all the stores and focus on online. That decision paid off, and so did her decision to advertise the brand on social media in 2011 at a time when few other retailers were doing the same. I couldn't afford traditional marketing methods. I'm just this, you know, girl just posting away on my social media, posting on Facebook before the days of Instagram, before the days of influencers. Um, and that's what helped grow the business. Was there a goal that you sort of set out to achieve that you thought to yourself, okay, once I get to this, then I've made it. I wanted to make um, more than my salary, which is I think $60,000 at the time and then I would be able to just comfortably say to my parents, like, at least I'm doing what I love now. Shopo is on track to make $70 million in sales this year, and they ship their designs to over 100 different countries. Plus, her mom, Queenie, is a fan of the brand. My friend always, oh, Queenie, oh, you your wear so beautiful. From your daughter? From your daughter? Yes, from my daughter's county. What is your biggest takeaway from everything you've experienced in what it means to become a successful entrepreneur? Being an entrepreneur, you, you just got to take some risks. You're going to fail. But if you make a mistake now, you're actually saving yourself from a much bigger mistake later. And honestly, as human beings, we're all stubborn. Someone can't tell you something. You need to have made those mistakes. So it's just part of the journey. Stick around for more female entrepreneurs who have found child's play can be the key to maintaining your own mental health after the break.
Welcome back, and it's slime time. I joined two female founders who have created a place where kids and adults can let loose. And it's about much more than just having fun. Take a look. I'm doing a job that every day I wake up and I feel good about doing it. One look inside this interactive experience and you're transported to a world full of color, joy, and slime. How did you get the name? Slumu Institute is the slime name for slime. It's from a trend in the internet in 2017 where people were changing the vowels of their name to double O. So Sarah would become Suru, slime becomes Slumu. And Chanel became Shunulu. I brought my daughter and her friends along to spend a day at the Slumu Institute, a place where visitors can experience slime in all its forms. And go! It's almost like once you put on your name tag with your slime name, it almost gives you permission to just kind of lean in. Lean in and let something go. This one's great. But for founders Sarah Schiller and Karen Rabinovitz, this goopy mecca is not just for kids. Both women found comfort in slime during difficult times. Tell me the idea behind this place. Five years ago, just everything in my life fell apart. And one day, a friend of mine happened to visit. She was there with her daughter. Her daughter had a bunch of slime in her bag. And then I didn't even realize it, but four hours went by. This was my first period of time of four hours that I didn't cry, that I didn't feel grief, that I didn't feel depressed, and I felt like a version of myself at seven. You have a huge smile. So Karen introduced Sarah to slime, and every weekend, the two would spend hours playing with Sarah's daughters. I have a 14-year-old daughter who has special needs. She has a rare genetic syndrome called Angelman syndrome, and my husband had a stroke five years ago, and he is severely disabled. So I live in a world with a lot of people who either can't speak or can't do a lot of the things that we all can do and, and take for granted. <laughs> After experiencing the joy of slime, Sarah and Karen launched Slumu, making it a point to create an inclusive workplace by hiring neurodiverse staff. That's people diagnosed with conditions like autism, ADHD, dyslexia, and other disorders. So right now I am pet packing care kits. Folks like Gideon Pianco, one of Slumu's star employees. Does it feel good to know that they trust you and they like you and they depend on you and they just think you're perfect for this job? It's always really great to have people who like me and care about me and want to give me a job that they don't give anybody else or so that they trust me more. It's pretty special. Yeah. I was the only one we trust with the cash to go to the bank. <laughs> We had someone stop us who was working in the space the other day and say, I want to thank you for creating such an amazing work environment. How does that feel? It's, it's just so rewarding. As guests continue to discover their slimy paradise, wow, nice. Karen and Sarah had their sights set on opening new locations in Chicago and Atlanta later this year. Did you ever imagine when you were at that low that you would be in a place talking to me, seeing my little nine-year-old and her friends happy. I never would have. And I think that's why this place means so much to me, because it gave me a life back. And I feel like this is all sort of, in a way, part of a rebirth. Let's turn to another female entrepreneur. This one went from barely being able to afford groceries to running a thriving hair care business that helps women look as confident as they feel. Donna Farazan has that story. Hair is such a big part of our confidence, especially as women, you know? When we look at ourselves in the mirror, the first two things we see are our face and our hair. And if we have a bad hair day, it does not matter what the rest of your day goes like. And for me, it was constant bad hair days. What was your relationship like with your hair growing up? I hated my hair my entire life. My hair never did what I wanted it to do. It was either too straight because I was relaxing it with a chemical relaxer and it didn't hold a curl. It was really like stringy and just like limp. There was no in between. Growing up, Gwen Jameer didn't see her inner light reflected in the outside world. 
when I was a little girl, there was one standard of beauty and it did not include me. And to see that on TV and then to see me in the mirror look completely different than what I was seeing, it was just a constant low self-esteem recipe. Becoming a mother was the push she needed to turn her frustration into action. I was actually pregnant with my son. He's now 11. I decided that I was no longer going to relax my hair for the nine months that I was pregnant. And I said, okay, I'm going to have to find products that are natural and safe because I want to make sure my baby's natural and safe and healthy. It led me down a rabbit hole to discover an ingredient called Rasul clay, which only comes from the Atlas Mountains in Morocco. And Donna, I'm telling you, for the first time ever, I had this euphoric experience with my hair. It was like, ah! 18 months after her euphoric discovery, her world changed. She was laid off from her job and found herself in the middle of a divorce. A single mother, out the blue, with $32 to my name. Here I am, how am I gonna pay my bills? The only thing I can think of is to work to monetize more this hobby I've created that I love so much. And so Natural Licious was born. Natural plant-based hair products created for women with curly, wavy, and textured hair types. It was something that brought me so much joy. Not only was I providing products that I literally saw change the entire trajectory of how women felt about themselves when they looked in the mirror, but I was also educating them because that's the one piece that's been missing for so long. Gwen soon cemented her place in history as the first African-American woman to hold a patent for a natural hair product. Essentially, I went back to college, but it was a self-imposed college. Every Tuesday, Thursday, and Friday, I was at the library or the USPTO satellite office learning about patent law. I'm excited to be the first, but I'm even more excited to not be the only. And that's what really, really gets me going. Since launching in 2013, Gwen says revenue for the business she started in her kitchen has reached $5 million annually via sales at more than 1,200 stores across the country and online. You've created this sisterhood and this community of people who are going to House of Gwen and, and they're graduating and they're coming out of it and they're feeling like the best version of themselves. How does that make you feel? I just want women to feel good, look good, so they know that they can take on the world. And talk about inspiring confidence. This next woman brings her own daily boost to her hundreds of thousands of followers using social media to motivate others to love their bodies and themselves. I'm wishing fewer healthy, genuine relationships and love on you. Bring your head here. Yeah. Social media powerhouse Achiang Agutu has gained a large following thanks to her infectiously unapologetic videos encouraging viewers to live their best lives. I have decided that I'm no longer going to shrink myself from the comfort of other people. <laughs> it's been a journey. I didn't start feeling like this until probably like five years ago. I was born and raised in Kisumu, Kenya. My parents really did their best to make sure that they instilled in me my worth. I moved to the United States in 2013 to Indiana, which was very different and a huge culture shock for me. I didn't find anyone who had, you know, the same life experiences as me or who talked like me and that transition was really difficult. My full name is Annie Achieng Agutu, and I went by Annie for the longest time because I always wanted to just be so palatable for the world. And there was one summer I decided like, no, I'm gonna go by a name that feels true to me, Achieng Agutu, say it right. This is a regular body, baby. I started talking about my journey of self-love and body positivity. And I started getting such great feedback from people saying, I really needed that today, thank you. Four or five years ago, I was that person who like needed that message. I had to be my own cheerleader. It always comes from a place of what I need to hear. Oh my God, nobody is going to hold me back. I will wear the outfits I want to wear. This jiggle will be jiggling all summer. My sense of fashion comes from my parents, especially my father, who dresses to the tees. My dad always said, you always have to dress your best. That's your own self-expression. And I really wanted that to shine through my videos. And the fashion world has taken notice from her profile in Vogue to invites to events around the Met Gala and New York Fashion Week. The fact that I am in this space with people that I look up to, representing a plethora of other women who look like me. I just feel happy and excited to be doing what I'm doing and to have a community that is so supportive and fabulous.
No, you're fabulous. <laughs> you are fabulous. <laughs> Thank this is, you. First of all, looking at you as a little girl yes. in Kenya and looking at you today, this confidence. You said one day you decided that you were going to go by the name that suited you. What happened in that moment that made you that made the lights go on and say, now things are going to change? I was just so tired of living for other people. Yeah. I was just doing everybody, everything to like impress people around me and not living for myself. Yeah. And so it was that switch where I was like, I need to start doing things for me, for, for Chiang Agutu, right? Yes. You know, I have to live my life for me. I have to love me. I have to be me unapologetically. Yeah. And you know, this is what I am today. And I'm so glad. <laughs> I mean, you, your confidence, yeah. like, radiates. Yeah. I can almost feel it. Thank you. But you know what else you do? Like, it's not enough for you just to feel good yourself. Mm -hmm. You want to lift up others. Mm -hmm. And that's why I think people have really fallen in love mm -hmm. with you. Why, why is that so important to you? Um, it's because... I had a time in my life where I didn't have that, right? There was nobody really around me who was saying, you're amazing, you're that girl, you're iconic, you're legendary, you're the moment. Mm -hmm. I did not have that support, and I knew what it felt like to be down in those depths. Mm -hmm. And I've always been looking for my purpose. You know, my parents have always been like, you find your purpose and what makes you happy. It really brings me joy to, you know, hype up somebody and, and to bring joy to somebody's, you know, life or day. You have so many followers. What, tell us what they mean to you. They mean the world to me. I think they've been able to bring me to where I'm at today. It just feels like I'm having a Beyonce moment every time I, I you know, I, I, I see my, my followers when I meet them in person. It's, you know, having this army of, army of people behind you really just cheering you on and supporting you and helping you get to where you want to be. I don't know about you, but I could definitely use that kind of positivity in my feed. After the break, we are keeping it coming with our daily morning boost. Stick around. Welcome back to The Boost. We have one more feel-good video for you today. Check it out. The yeah. woman named Annie was turning 30, so her friends surprised her with a big birthday weekend. And at some point, they made Annie put on a T-shirt that had an old-school picture of her on it. And here's what happened next. All 15 of Annie's friends dressed up <laughs> oh. to look like her in that childhood oh, wow. photo. Oh, they nailed gosh. it. Same hair, same shirt, of course, Very timeless Megan. fashion. It is. <laughs> And the good news, no one got a bigger kick out of it than Annie herself. That's a fun group of friends. Which one's Annie? <laughs> That's not easy to do either. It's like the real Slim Shady. What a great way to end our show today. We'll be back with you tomorrow, bringing you more of our favorite feel-good stories. See you next time here on Today All Day.
and thanks for joining us for Consumer Confidential. I'm Vicki Wynn. The headlines can be troubling. A recent spike in violence across the country. In New York City alone, NYPD's recent data shows crime is up 38% overall this year. Shootings have risen 32%. Transit crime, that's up 70%. And car thefts, those have jumped a staggering 93%. Several other cities also reporting a major spike in carjackings, including Minneapolis, where it's up 63% and 85% in Philadelphia. Now, these numbers can shatter our sense of security. That's why for the next 25 minutes, we're focusing on personal safety and protection. Learn simple ways to protect your property without spending a lot of money. As we start planning spring and summer vacations, what can you do to make sure thieves don't know you're gone? Plus, what to look for when you're shopping for one of those popular doorbell cameras and some basic self-defense techniques so you can escape an attacker. But first, how to navigate potentially dangerous encounters during everyday activities from commuting to shopping. A spate of recent violent crimes caught on tape. In Philadelphia, this man pulls a woman out of her car and takes off, leading to a wild chase that ends on foot where police finally arrest him. In Chicago, two men approach a woman and push her up against a wall. Police say they stole her belongings and ran off. In San Jose, California police say this man breaks the windows, snatches a purse from a woman sitting inside, and takes off in a getaway car. FBI data shows assaults and vehicle theft have increased from 2014 to 2020. So how can you protect yourself in some everyday scenarios? I enlist the help of former NYPD detective Mike Sapraconi, who is now the president of Squad Security. So here we are in a shopping center. What do we need to be aware of? And you want to be at a place close to the location you're going. And park next to a lamppost, especially during the winter when it gets dark earlier. So, Mike, I feel like a common time that you're vulnerable is when you're just getting back from the store, you're distracted, you're putting things in your car. What do we need to know here? Pay attention. Look at your surroundings. Put the things in your car as quickly as possible. Check around. Make sure there's nobody else watching you or observing you. What if someone comes up and they want my purse? Give it to them. No fighting. Don't fight. Never fight. Give them your purse. Let them take your purse. What should I do when it comes to my car keys? I would put them in my pocket along with your phone on your person okay. rather than put them in the purse because if they snatch your purse, at least you still have a way to get out of here with your car. Cities across the country have reported spikes in violent carjackings. Watch this incident in broad daylight in the middle of New York City. Carjackings last year up 55% in New York, 63% in Minneapolis, and 85% in Philadelphia. It might sound counterintuitive, but some experts say part of the reason carjackings are increasing has to do with the fact that cars are more secure now than ever before. You've probably seen it in the movies. Thieves starting a car like this. Oh my God, you know the hot wire car? But nowadays, new cars rely on key fobs, and that makes it a lot harder for thieves to get away unless they have this. Remember to keep your car doors locked, even while driving. Mike says make sure your windows are up high enough that someone can't reach in. Mike, let's say I'm stopped and some people come up and they try to carjack me. What do I need to know? Always give them the car. Unless you have your children in the back seat or something, give them the car. It's not worth it. Mike, it's cold out. A lot of people like to warm up the car before they get in or they leave it running because they're going to go in the store real quick. What say you? No, definitely not. No, no value to doing that. It's an opportunity. When the thieves see the smoke coming, that's like a smoke alarm coming to them and saying, hey, there's a call. Let's take it. As for public transit, Mike says stay vigilant. He investigated many crimes where thieves targeted distracted riders. He says the risk starts when you enter. Be careful on the stairs, an easy place for pickpockets to snatch your valuables from behind. Vicky, I just got your phone. Your bag was wide open, you weren't paying attention, and it was so easy for me to just grab your phone out of your bag. So what should I do? Pay attention, move your bag to the front, walk your bag, and be aware of somebody walking behind you on the steps. Mike, what about this? A lot of times people are commuting, they put earbuds in. Bad idea. It, it just takes away one of your senses. You should never have something that can't let you hear everything that's going around you. Avoid the temptation to stand near the track and pay attention to anyone coming into your personal space. You know, people have a tendency, they want to see when the train's coming, they get close to the edge. What do you say about that? Step aside. Always step back. Stay six feet off the, the yellow. The yellow's there for a reason. When it's time to board, try to ride in the car with the conductor. In New York City, they always pull up to these zebra stripes. All right, Mike, so we get on the train. Where's the safest place to sit? I would always think the middle is the safest place, not by a door. Okay. Because if you sit by a door, somebody can be 
lingering or they're watching you as the door's open, you could snatch your bag. What if the train's crowded, there's no seats? Hold the pole, get by a pole right. in the middle of the train, mm -hmm. and put your purse between your body and the pole. Oh, okay. Some good reminders to help you stay alert and safe. Our thanks to Mike for that. And a bonus tip, if you are riding public transit in most cities, sit in the front car. That is often where the train operator is located. And when you're parking at a mall, look for that security booth in the parking lot. Try to find a spot near the guard shack. Coming up, it was made to keep track of your belongings, from keys to purses. But some have reported Apple's popular air tags have been used for stalking. What you need to know. And later, simple things you can do to beef up security at home without breaking the bank. Consumer Confidential, coming right back. Warning now about popular tracking devices from Apple. They're called AirTags, and they track the locations of common items like your keys and your wallets. But people across the country have reported being stalked by strangers. We took one out to see how it can happen. I was at the bar alone. Model Brooks Nader was at a crowded bar in Manhattan when she says someone dropped an Apple AirTag into her coat pocket. The device, roughly the size of a quarter, links to a cell phone through the Find My app designed to help you track your things. But now it's being linked to concerns about safety and privacy. When I was almost home, I got this notification on my home screen pop up saying that I was being tracked and I had been for a while now. Um, which is basically when I knew something wasn't right. Nader estimates the AirTag was in her pocket for five hours. The device's owner able to track her every move before she got that alert. I also didn't know what an AirTag was or anything like that. So I was definitely worried and concerned. And Nader isn't alone. OK, so I think I'm being tracked. And On social media, others United reporting United finding United. random air tags. I was being informed that there has been an air tag that has been following me. Tucked in, tucked in right here. Law enforcement agencies across the country are also warning these air tags can be used to track cars, allowing criminals to steal the vehicles once they're parked overnight. It's literally been like tracking her car. To show you how these air tags work, I'm teaming up with investigative producer Joe Enoch. Joe, what do you got? Vicky, I got my air tag. Okay. I'm going to put it in your purse. All right. We'll see what happens. Bye. Bye. I hit the streets of New York City with Joe watching me from his desk. First stop, got to warm up, get something to drink. Must be time for a coffee break. Able to see the exact stores I go in. Vicky is definitely doing some shopping at Sephora. Will it work in the subway? All right. Here we go. Underground. Anywhere there's a cell signal, Joe can see the air tag in my bag moving with me. Vicky is really moving now. My guess, she's on the subway. Taxi ride. One last stop. Finally, time to head to lunch. Joe's not far behind, using his phone to track my location. It looks like it's just right up here on the right. The device leading him right to me. Whoa, <laughs> hey, you, found, oh my gosh. Right there. There, 
Wow, yep. you pinpointed me right to my table. Exactly. <laughs> All with this little guy here. It was easy. If you had slipped this in without telling me, I would have had no clue that you were following my every move. Scary. Yeah, that is pr pretty scary. I didn't receive a warning notification until I got home. It is now four hours after Joe put the tag in my purse, and I just got the alert that there was an air tag somewhere near me. Apple says those alerts make it harder for air tags to go undetected. The company also updated the air tags to sound this alarm if they're away from their owners for 8 to 24 hours. In a statement, Apple says, we take customer safety very seriously and are committed to AirTag's privacy and security. AirTag is designed with a set of proactive features to discourage unwanted tracking, a first in the industry, that both inform users if an unknown AirTag might be with them and deter bad actors from using an AirTag for nefarious purposes. Now, this is important. Experts say if you get that alert or you find an air tag in your belongings, don't go home. That could reveal where you live. Instead, go immediately to your local police department or a public place and then call police and ask them to meet you. Apple told us they will work with law enforcement to help track down the actual owner of the air tag. Now, following our report, Apple did make some changes to its air tag. Joining us now to talk about that and much more is tech expert and Tom's Guide Global Editor in Chief, Mark Spoonauer. Mark, great to see you. Thanks for being here. Thank you. All right. So so let's start with these changes that Apple made. I don't think they anticipated that bad guys would use their air tags in this way, but we saw what can happen. So what are they doing about it? Yeah, in a way, they've made tracking almost too easy, right? Not just for items, but for people. So what they've promised is that they're going to be rolling out some changes later this year. I wish we actually had a timetable for those changes, but they're important and they're threefold. So first, the sound of the alerts will actually get louder. That's one of the complaints okay. that we had in our initial reviews, that yeah. it was just too faint, especially if it's underneath a couch. So what about a car? Right, right. exactly, you won't hear it. <laughs> exactly, so the, the second change is that it's going to be easier and faster the time element is really key yes. to get those alerts because it can't be hours that pass, it right. needs to be minutes. Uh. And the last thing is precision finding. So the same feature that's available to you and I mm -hmm. using augmented reality and the live camera view so you'll get an exact location of where that air tag is using the camera and arrows that direct you directly to it. Wow, really interesting. Well, it's good to see that they are doing something, and I think that makes people feel a lot better. So what are some of the things that people can do to take advantage of other types of personal technology, like our phones, to help make us safer? Well, I think the number one thing is that if you're using your phone right now, turn off location services if mm -hmm. you don't need it. And there are some apps that say, use it only while using the app. Right, or, like Google Maps. Right, or all the time in the background. And I would say, turn that off. Don't use that unless you absolutely need it. There are ways to share your location with family and friends and specialized apps for that, which is fine. Okay. But I would turn that off. The other thing is, I would turn off Wi-Fi and Bluetooth if you don't need it, because there mm. are other vectors for p potential attacks that you don't want to activate. But the other important thing that people don't realize is that your phone itself can be an SOS beacon, mm -hmm. right? So look at the SOS features that are built into the iPhone and Samsung phones, for example. So you just press the side button and slide to activate it on the iPhone. On Samsung, you just press the power button a few times to activate it there. And don't just know how to activate the feature. Make sure that you fill out your emergency contacts on your iPhone or Samsung device to make sure that when that ping is sent out, it's not just going to law enforcement. As soon as you hang up with 911, your family members will also be notified. So set that up on your phone. Oh, that's really good. And turning off Wi-Fi and Bluetooth can help save your battery too. So that's a good yes. tip. <laughs> Let's talk about doorbells. What should people know before they invest in a doorbell camera? Well, number one is that the video quality is definitely getting better, but there's certain features that you need to look for when you're buying a video doorbell. One is look at the aspect ratio and how wide mm -hmm. the, the viewing angle is. Wider is better? Yeah, so wider is better, but also taller. Okay. So you want to be able to look at packages as they're delivered and other things that are there. And some people can try to duck down when you're wow. when you're using your doorbell camera. So look at, make sure you have an ultra wide viewing angle and also make sure that it's tall. The other thing is uh, make sure that you're signing up for the, the video storage online. Mm -hmm. And if you can, make sure that you have a battery backup as well as local storage if it's available to you as an option because you don't want to necessarily have to rely on, on the cloud. Got it. So you have two places, that video, that may be valuable in case a crime is committed. To, to find it. Yeah, and the last thing is make sure that you're looking for a package detection because these cameras are getting smarter. It used to be the case that if a leaf would blow by, <laughs> you would mm -hmm. get an alert. Right. But now they're that. smart enough to recognize pets, faces, and packages. So look for a doorbell that has all of these features built in. 
And quickly now, when it comes to security, what apps do you recommend? Um, I mean, there's a bunch out there that we like, but one that is really good is called Noonlight. And it's a personal safety app, and it's almost like a panic button on your phone. It's Noonlight? very... Noonlight? Yes. Okay. And it's very easy to use. So all you have to do is just press that button. It's almost like a security system on the go, right? Oh, wow. The authorities and police will be notified and they'll go directly to your location and your friends and family will be notified. Plus, there's this timeline feature built in so that let's say you're going on a Tinder date, you can actually fill out that information mm -hmm. and then your friends and family will be contacted and they'll have that context in terms of where you were supposed to be versus where you are. Learn so much. Mark Spoonauer, <laughs> thank you so much for coming in and sharing all your expertise. Really appreciate it. And up next, simple moves to help you escape an encounter with a would-be attacker. But first, when we come back, how to make your home less attractive to thieves even when you're on vacation. You're watching Consumer Confidential. Now a closer look at home security across the country caught on camera brazen crooks smashing windows, knocking down doors, even impersonating police officers. These cases can make us feel vulnerable. With spring break right around the corner, you may be traveling or leaving your home unattended, but there are some easy ways to protect your space from thieves. From coast to coast, home security camera footage released by police captures burglars in action. In New York City, these crooks posed as police officers to get inside, overpower the homeowners, and walk off with $130,000 in cash and jewelry. In Phoenix, burglars deploy a battering ram to break in. In Los Angeles, a mother and her baby followed home and robbed in their driveway. And in Beverly Hills, 81-year-old philanthropist Jacqueline Avant, wife of famed music executive Clarence Avant, shot dead in her home. Police apprehended and later charged this suspect, who also attempted to break into another nearby home. Though national statistics show burglaries are in decline, these cases can shatter our sense of security. While it can be scary to think about these crimes, there are simple steps you can take to prevent the criminals from targeting you and your home. I enlist the help of Mike Zapraconi, who's a former NYPD detective with 16 years of experience. He's now the president of Squad Security, a global security firm. Mike, when it comes to these bad guys breaking in, what's the first thing we should know? Well, these are crimes of opportunities, so we want to make it as difficult as possible for them to come to your home and break in. What's the most common way criminals get into someone's home? Basic things, checking doors, checking windows. They're going to look for something that might be open, unlocked, like this. Uh. If it's locked, they're going to move on. Mike says breaking windows and doors can alert neighbors, and many criminals will move on if there isn't a convenient way in. Another common thing people do, they hide the key under the doormat or maybe nearby the front door. Anywhere in proximity to the door, they're going to check. Don't do it. 
If you have a security system, Mike says to occasionally call your company to make sure the software and equipment are up to date. No alarm system? He says a video doorbell can be a cheaper alternative. These days, many of us also rely on delivery services, so our packages can pile up. We all know about porch pirates, mm -hmm. but this is also a key that no one's home at all. The more things you leave out, more people are going to know you're not home. Got to get these inside quickly. Always, quick as possible. What if you have to go on vacation and you're going to leave your home empty? You want to make your home feel as secure as possible, so you want to always try to do as much as you can to make that person, the burglar, think someone's home. You want to maybe leave lights on? put some shades down. You want to be able to not have somebody be able to look into your window mm -hmm. and see that nobody's around. And if you park your car outside, keep your car doors locked because if you have an automatic garage door opener programmed inside, it'll work even if there are no keys. Mike says thieves sometimes strike right when you get home. So look around before getting out of your car. Be aware of your surroundings and avoid talking and texting on your phone. Let's say you come home and something's not right. The door is open, a window's open. What should you do? Step back for a minute. Call 911, get to a safe place, give them a description, of what you saw. Don't go inside. So what happens, Mike, if you're inside and someone breaks in? Don't confront them. Step back, give them whatever they're asking for. It's usually property. You get a really good description, and then when the opportunity comes, call the police once you're safe. Mike, again, with those great tips. And don't forget about the items you leave outside around the house. A spade can be used to smash a window. A ladder can be used to get into your second floor. So clean up those tools. Also, if you are going away, ask a friend or a neighbor to pick up your mail. Or you can also request the post office to put it on hold while you're gone. Well, next up, we're going to be hanging out with two black belts. When we come back, learn some self-defense moves to help you get out of a potentially dangerous run-in. some simple things you can do if you ever find yourself in a dangerous encounter. We're all geared up. The key really here is to give yourself enough time to make a run for it. To help us with all of that, martial arts instructors Sharice King and Adam Ladd, thank you both for being here. You're a second degree black belt. Yes. Adam, you're a fifth degree black belt. Combined, you have more than 50 years of experience. Okay, so Sharice, let me start with you. Not all of us can have this kind of experience, but what if you are just a beginner and you want to stay safe and, and just some basic tips to keep yourself safe when you're out there? All right, some basic things you want to think about when you're outside is just being aware. Being aware is one of the things that you, if you just know your surroundings, you'll be, you'll, you kind of see things happening, mm -hmm. right? Like when I'm on a train, I'm always looking around. Somebody comes on, I want to see who, what, you have, what kind of bag you're holding. If you look suspicious, I'll leave the train. I'll go to the next cart, right? right. So just being aware, uh, if you're on the train, having your back against the wall, not standing on the edge of the platform. I see a lot of people that just kind of like, like to wait on the edge. I just don't understand it, right? Yeah. I like to keep my back so I can, you know, no one's behind me, right? We're getting a lot of people lately getting pushed. So yeah. those are some things that can really save your life or save you be aware of who's in your personal face the space don't have your head buried in a phone yeah. for example what about kids Adam you work with a lot of young students what do you teach them 
you have to make a scene. If, you, if someone picks you up and takes you, you got to say, this is not my mom, this is not my dad, and, and just be loud, make a scene, make sure people are looking at you. Mm -hmm. um, and then keep that contact with your parents, right? A lot of kids like to walk around with their head in their screens, and they, really, they kind of lose that, that touch with their parents, and make, keeping that contact mm -hmm. keeps that form of awareness as well, like, like Sharice was saying, is, is being aware of your surroundings. Same thing, take your head out of the phone, take your head out of the iPad. Yeah, and practice like that. that with your kids, right? Practice yelling or breaking away? Absolutely. Okay, we're Absolutely. gonna do some practicing too. Yes. Sharice, let's say someone does get a hold of you. What are some techniques for getting away? Um, so some basic techniques, uh, say someone grabs you, right? Mm -hmm. They grab you with, with one hand, yeah. right? You wanna work against the thumb. All you gotta do is just pull out the thumb. Pull really? Out. Okay, yeah, just no, pull out your no, thumb? No, no, oh. pull your arm out. Go, oh, pull. pull out of the thumb. Look at that. Ah, okay. So that's a weak point yeah. in your hand, the thumb. Yeah, that's oh, a weak point. got it, okay. Right? Or if someone, say they grab you two hands, right. now you're like, okay, I can't pull out with right. just one, grab your own fist, grab, grab it. my own fist. Now pull out. Oh, oh okay, so right? use my own body weight to help. Another thing, like someone grabs you, right? I grab you. That's easy. I don't wanna, right yeah. here, right? Okay. Mm -hmm. And all you do is just, you grab, you pull away, and you, pu and you pu pull your body back, you push away. So I push right? away off of you. So yeah. you grab my shirt. So I grab, push. And then I have to push away yeah. from you. Right, oh. grab me. Gotcha, okay. Yes. All right, I'm just here, uh -huh. push off. Okay, right? got it. Pretty simple, Yeah, right? I like that. The thumb is an easy one, yeah, just you to just grab out of there or use your hand. Okay, very mm -hmm. good. So I know you have some simple moves too that we can practice aside from those getaways, yes. but you know, you're trying to buy time so you can get away. You're not trying to get into a big fight with this assailant, yeah. right? No. So show me some simple things that anyone can do. Okay. Okay, so a uh, couple basic striking tips. Um, you want to stick with, with our, our super basic strikes. Uh -huh. Our super basic striking is not punching. It's actually not punching. A lot of people, when they try to punch somebody, will break their own hand. Because they're doing it the wrong yeah, way. Yeah, they'll yeah. do it the wrong way. Even, I mean, even boxers break their own hand because they oh. punch so hard, right? It's, it's just the, the force and, and maybe you're not holding your fist the right way. So we like to, to teach very, very basics at the start. So first would be the hammer strike. Hammer strike is very, very powerful. You're using, using the fat part of your hand right down by your pinky and you just drive it like a hammer. Right, she comes right down on top of the head, bang, that's where it is. Uh, next one is your palm strike, like the palm heel. You don't want to slap high five, mm -hmm. right? I want down here, and mm -hmm. you throw it just like a punch. We teach the punch and the palm strike that the only difference is your hands open and close. So she comes right straight Bye. and hits the palm and make sure we're, yep, hitting down here right by the wrist. Okay. Um, and then another one that we teach for, for our basic self-defense is the groin kick. Right. All right, we, we call it a point kick. Yeah. Um, just to, to get away from doing our traditional front kick. So when Sharice throws a point kick, there's no, there, there's tech beat behind it because you're pushing off right, of the foot. Pointing you kick, your foot, yep, yeah. You point your foot, and you're not hitting with your foot. You want your shin. Oh, okay. You want you want the most leg possible. Okay. Doing the damage, Got right? It. And the shin is the, is a hard part of the leg, so that's your best best bet. Is okay, so not the, the ballerina toe. You want to get close. Oh, and just yes. Use yes. the shin. Yes. The okay. shin is the shin is where, where it's at. So those are pretty simple things anyone can practice. You know, the heel strike. Mm -hmm. You said the hammer, right? Yeah, the hammer fist. Hammer yep. fist down, mm -hmm. and then that just that point, point kick, kick. But really going with the shin. Yep. Yeah. Three basic ones. Nice and easy. If you're in tight quarters, the only the 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 one that we didn't talk about was the elbow strike. Oh, okay. The elbow strike, if you're in really, really tight quarters, right, bang. This is, wow. and you notice how she's... Yeah, okay, that's intense. Just, yes. Okay. <laughs> I try to pull me in. Right. Uh, so, it, and it's, yeah, you, you just hit right sharp, and it's right a very, here. yeah, it's a sharp cut. And what are you aiming for? Should you be aiming for anything? Or With just... an elbow, you can hit wherever you want on the head, it's going to hurt. Okay. It's going to stun them. I mean, it, it is, it is... Uh, uh, a very, very hard, hard part, of your, part of your body to hit with. Okay. All right, but if you if if you have the ability to aim, mm -hmm. you want to go for the nose. Right, you want to go for the temple. Mm -hmm. Go for the chin. Okay. Uh, if you if you're good enough, you go for the the, the throat. Right. Hey, what if right you're there? small? Like I'm smaller than you. What should I be doing? Because I maybe I can't get up there. Well, for, for smaller, it, it changes. It mm -hmm. changes. You can reach up with a hammer strike if you need to, and and you're you're point of contact changes. So if I, if Ms. Reese goes low, she gets shorter, go, go shorter. Now she's striking up. Right. Now, and it's not necessarily the front of the face, but if she throws a palm strike right here and lifts my chin up, yeah. that's, that's where the power is. And then more access to the throw the here. Throat, huh? yep. okay. And then you're even closer to the groin. Right. So you have, you still have points of contact that you can make. You don't need to be face to face. And that gives her time to, to get away. Correct. This is one, one, a couple good shots and you're out of there. Okay. I think we have a little time. Did you want to demonstrate that throw? This is for sure. an advanced move, right? But yeah. This is, this is an advanced move. Right. And, and she's just like You want to do the hip throw? <laughs> you want to do a, a double leg takedown? You do a hip toss. Hip toss? Hip toss. Here All right. Go. So there's a lot of different ways to do the hip toss. Mm -hmm. All right. So uh, what she's going to do she grabs, she, she's gonna gain control first. She steps in. Okay. When she steps in, now look, see how the hips are lined right, up? Right. She wants her hips just a little bit lower than mine, feet inside of mine, okay. right? The feet's gotta be inside, this is her base. Now uh -huh. all she's gotta do, don't throw me yet, just lift me up. So watch how she lifts me, it's with her legs. Right. It's just with the legs, nice okay. and easy lift. Now right. when she wants to throw, she throws, 
There you go, over, okay. And she keeps the control of the arm. Right. Okay, wow, okay, so that's not recommended for beginners. <laughs> but that's just something cool you can do if you're two, two black belts. Yeah. Okay, fantastic. Well, thank you. Adam Ladd, Therese King, such a pleasure to have you. Thank you very much thank for you. all of those techniques. Thank you so thank much. You. Giving me a chance to get into a gi. Absolutely. That is our time for now. Thank you for hanging out with us, for all of us at NBC News. I'm Vicki Wynn. Join us next time for another edition of Consumer Confidential. In the meantime, practice some of these techniques and stay safe out there. When most of us think about Detroit, Motown, car manufacturing, even sports comes to mind. But when it comes to food, the folks here in the Motor City are all about one famous Frank, the Coney Dog. And no, we're not talking about Coney Island in New York. In Michigan, a Coney is both a diner to locals and a hot dog smothered in chili, topped with onions, and finished off with a <laughs> of mustard. Now, there are dozens of Coneys in the Detroit metro area. Some bear the Coney Island name, others don't. But you'll always find some type of sausage, a bun, and a signature meat sauce on the menu. So, what makes Michigan crazy for Coney's? Let's find out. The relationship be between Coney's and Detroit, it's a long relationship. It's a long love story. <laughs> the Coney is, is a part of Detroit. If you can drive and eat a Coney, it's not a Detroit style Coney in my opinion. It's time to head out of Studio 1A and hit the road for a new kind of culinary adventure. Follow me as I taste some of the most iconic foods around the country and meet the families behind them. Together, we're going to learn how a good meal has the power to connect us to our past, our future, and each other. Welcome to Detroit. What do you say we travel back in time to the earliest days of the Coney? The folks at American Coney Island have been dishing up this local specialty for more than 100 years. In fact, this restaurant and the one next door, well, they've got a shared history. But American has been run by the same family for three generations. Founded by a Greek immigrant, this restaurant story is synonymous with the legendary hot dog of this city. What do you say we go meet the family? One to go plain, one fry. At American Coney Island, hot dogs aren't just a meal, they're memories. Grace Kiros is the third generation owner of this legendary spot. Grace. Al. Hi, good to see oh, you right. again. Good to see it's been you. a long time. It is. We sat down to talk Coney traditions, turning points, and of course, toppings. People are very passionate about their Coney Island hot dog. Here. Yes, they are. Why? Because it holds a nostalgia and a tradition to them. We see daily generations of people coming in here. Remember grandpa bringing them, my mom brought me. It, it's part of their growing up, it's part of their life. 30 years ago, Grace took over the restaurant reigns from her dad, Chuck Kiros. Chuck inheriting the business from his father, founder Constantine Kiros, AKA Gust. Your place, this place on this corner has been here for 105 years. What is it like being really part of the fabric of, of an iconic city like Detroit? It's surreal. I mean, I think back to my grandfather and my dad and the things they saw here from, from riots to Tigers winning the World Series when they were good. Such a deep history and, and proud. Mm -hmm. I love this city. The Coney craze in Detroit is really a legacy of the Kiros family. Historian Joe Grimm co-writing the book on Coney's in the Motor City. The Kiroses came to Detroit from Dara in Greece, where this was a sheep herding town, and they needed to find work. And they really struck gold, as in the color of mustard, when they started making these Coney Island hot dogs. In the late 1800s, Greece was facing a massive economic crisis, setting off a wave of global migration. By 1920, it's estimated that over 400,000 Greeks immigrated to the United States seeking new opportunities. Like most European immigrants of the era, they passed through New York before moving on to other parts of the country. They entered, most of them, through Ellis Island, which is near Coney Island. They saw people on Coney Island and in New York eating hot dogs and said, ah, we're going to go into the hot dog business, but we're going to top it with something Greek 
Now, the true origins, like who invented the Coney Dog, lost to history. It just sort of happened in a lot of places in about the same time, mostly by Greek immigrants. Gust and his brother, Bill Kuros, opening one of Detroit's first Coney shops in the early 1900s. A family rift caused the brothers to split, leading to side-by-side -side Coney operations and a long-lasting restaurant rivalry. Detroiters swearing allegiance to American or Lafayette, but only American is still owned by the Kuros family today. We figure well more than 100 Coney Islands can trace their lineage directly to that flat top grill. Each Coney spot in the Detroit area and throughout Michigan has its own history from national to Kirby's, to Nicky D's, from Berkeley Coney Island, to L. George's, to Leo's, and more. But all of the city's Coney's have a similar foundation, starting with a steamed bun. You add a beef and pork hot dog. Then it's covered with a chili sauce. And the chili sauce is where Coney owners can improvise and innovate. And then on top of that, it's going to be a yellow salad mustard and diced onions and never any ketchup. If you put ketchup on a Coney dog, you might get thrown out of the restaurant. Definitely a controversial condiment here. Definitely no ketchup. But I see ketchup behind. Is we that... sell french fries. When customers come to the carryout and want, you know, I'll have a Coney with everything. Every once in a while you get, okay, I want ketchup on mine too. We don't do it. We refuse to put the ketchup on the hot dog. And we've had people so good, a little upset with us. I'm like, Dude, I'm not putting ketchup on the hot dog. Your, your grandfather immigrates here from, from, from Greece. Greece. Why hot dogs? It was something that he had seen when he landed at Ellis Island in New York. He saw, you know, the amusement park. You gotta remember, he was a young man, came over with no money, I mean, borrowed a pair of shoes. He heard the automotive business was hiring in Detroit, made his way to Detroit, thinking they'll hire me even though I don't know how to read or write. They didn't. On this little corner right here where we are now, he started a little push cart. You know, we're Greek, right? We know food. So Grandpa remembered the hot dogs, made a Greek chili sauce. Our chili is a little unique. You hear about a Coney Island hot dog. You yes. think about Nathan's in New York City. But here's the difference. I'm going to stop you. OK. A Coney Island in New York is an amusement park right. that sells hot dogs. In Detroit, a Coney Island is the actual, it's the hot dog with the chili mustard onions on it. That's the difference. And I got a lot of heated arguments with people about that. Really? In Detroit, it is the actual thing you're eating, thanks to my grandpa, because he named it American Coney Island. He was so grateful he was in America and all the opportunities were given to him. Grace now in charge of carrying on the family legacy. It's obviously been passed from generation to yes. generation here, but each time you lose a member of the generation, it, it's got to be tough. You just lost your dad. Yes. Uh, not too long ago. Yeah, six months ago. When you come in, do you feel him here? I do. I, I, yes, I do. And I feel a sense of pride. I miss him a lot, obviously. But I, I just feel his presence. I feel everything he, he taught me. My grandpa did his thing. Then once my dad stepped in and took over, he took it to the next level. Then I took it to a whole nother level with my brother's help included. Grace's brother, Chris Soteropoulos, helps run the business today. There's an American outpost at the Detroit Zoo, plus a new location in Las Vegas. They're also shipping Coney kits all across the country. You get everybody yeah. from all walks of life, exactly. every demographic, every racial component, you everybody it, comes here. Yes. The American Coney is the great equalizer. It, that's, I love the way you put it that way, Al. Exactly. We love the, our customers. I mean, our customers are like family. It's no joke. This is who made us. So we treat you like family. We don't know any different. Coming up, I learned how to make the quintessential Coney. One up! Right there, nice shot. Yeah.
At American Coney Island, the oldest family-run Coney spot in Detroit, they keep things traditional. But you know, as I look at your menu, and I look at the pictures, they're uh, v vintage, let's That's say. It doesn't look like you have strayed that much from the original menu. We haven't. I, I won't. Why add to it when it's working? You know what else is working? Me. I got behind the grill with Grace to prep the perfect plate of conies. This is the proprietary hot dog. If you notice the natural casing. Yes. It's a 90% beef, 10% pork with a lamb skin casing. That's that, like three meats in one. You exactly. Got, uh, pork, beef, and, a, and That's lamb. That's right. And that's what makes it pop, like when you bite into it oh, and snap, snap. It's like a party in your mouth. Yes. yes. That detail kept popping up everywhere we went. It's a warm bond, it's the, it's the snap of the hot dog. When you bite it, you hear that pop. You can tell it's a natural casing because when you bite it, it snaps back at you. The steamer bun. Ah. That's the, what we were taught. They're in a oh, steamer. You know, there's steamer. just enough steam in mm -hmm. here. So you're going to pull out the bun. Right. Look, look for the cut. Yep. So open it up a little, grab your plate. Yes. All right, so we're gonna grab one. Right. Come over here. Do you want to top it or do you want to? I want to watch the top. Okay, give it a little mix. Little, this is that. Little zhuzh. Greek, yeah, that's right. It gets a little messy. Some chili, add a little more, you know, mm -hmm. be cheap with the chili. Greek spices, yes. that's the magic. The secret spice blend? Well, it's secret. But the chili is made with ground beef. The tangy mustard. Tangy. Just a little lime, nothing, nothing more. You take some onions, sprinkle them across, and there you go. Boom. Okay. 105 years. 105 years of magic. magic. My turn. Get a plate. I need one up, which means one. I need one for a customer. One for Everything a customer. Everything on it. Chili, mustard, onions. Get the split. Open it up a little more, El. A little All right. more? That's not too bad. OK. <laughs> Boom. All right, now you I come over here. Keep the bun open because you want oh, the chili oh, to go in. Oh, you want the chili to go in. Yeah, you want the chili. You want it, yeah. You want that You're chili. Don't chintz out on that yeah, chili. Really, don't chintz on the chili. Turn your dish a little so it's easier oh, for you to pour over there. All right. There. Oh, that really it does have a creamy See, consistency. See, it's really creamy, right. Exactly. And mustard. There you go. Ooh, that's heavy mustard. Did they order heavy mustard? Um, no, they didn't. <laughs> I, I'm making this for myself. <laughs> exactly. There you go. All right. One up. Ready. There, yeah, nice shot. Yeah. Awesome. Woo. Good job, Al. Hey, now. Life-changing experience. Mm. It's magic in your mouth. Every great Coney needs a great bun, but not just any bun will do. A few miles from downtown Detroit is another family-run institution that's keeping the Coney tradition alive. 
What started as a small baking business is now one of the state's biggest suppliers of Coney buns. And that bun is the Coney Island Steamer. That's a good bun. The Coney Island Steamer is a six inch hot dog bun. At Metropolitan Baking Company, they like big buns and they cannot lie. The Coney Island Steamer bun is our flagship item on the bun and roll line. Not to mention, they claim to have buns of steel. These buns sit in a steam table. The product's formulated for that steam table. That bun is going to sit there, and it's not going to fall apart on you when you load it with all those condiments. In Michigan, Coney dogs aren't just a tasty meal. They're big business. The Coney business gave rise to supplier industries, just as the auto industry did. So we need to have a major bun maker here. The big maker nowadays is Metropolitan Bakery, and they bake these Coney dog buns with the sponge dough method. For three generations, the Cordes family, who also traced their roots back to Greece, has risen to the occasion selling specialty breads. Metropolitan Baking Company was founded by my grandfather in 1945. In the beginning, Metropolitan only sold simple loaves. Today, they produce dozens of items for grocery stores, high-end restaurants, and of course, Coney Diners. And while their products have changed over the years, a few names have truly stood the test of time. He was George James Cordes, uh, namesake, and my father is James George Cordes, and I'm George James Cordes. My father, just like me, was, was, was bred in the business. George credits his father for the company's massive expansion in the mid 80s. This summer, we're gonna be producing millions of Coney Island steamer hot dog buns. This abundance, pun intended, is all thanks to automation. Automation is, is really what transformed this company. We went from packaging maybe 10, 15 loaves of bread a minute to 140 loaves a minute. In 2001, after years of recipe testing, the signature steamer bun was added to the product line. It is a hot dog bun that we've formulated to be used at the Coney Island restaurants um, in Metro Detroit specifically. This bun that we produce is in roughly 95% of all Coney Island restaurants. And it takes a lot of dough to make all those buns. So what we're doing right now, this is where it all begins. This is the mixing room, and we're about to create a 1,600-pound dough batch of hot dog buns. Major ingredients are going to be flour is 65%, you know, then you've got your yeast, you've got your sugar, you've got your oil, you know, and a bunch of, bunch of proprietary ingredients. Any minute. That's um, roughly 1,200 packages of Coney Island steamer hot dog buns. There you go. You did it. <laughs> that makes over 14,000 buns. After mixing, the dough gets cut into bun-sized portions. You're looking at three-foot sheets that were just guillotined, and now they're going into a smaller divider to be put into roughly uh, 1.25-ounce dough balls. Next up, time to proof. After 60 minutes, the dough has risen. And after about 10 minutes bake time, we're gonna have a fully baked hot dog bun that's prepared to cool. The buns are almost ready. The product's sliced, you know, after the cooling conveyor, and then it's paddled on top of each other to create a 12 pack, a dozen buns. The baskets are headed down to logistics and ready to be set up for routes. Then it's off to stores in Michigan's finest Coney restaurants, including American Coney Island. While the factory may have a lot of machinery, George has always been hands-on. So I worked here every summer throughout high school and throughout college, almost every position. And you really learn what hard work is as a kid to work in a bread factory, you know, when it's 110 degrees out. When Grandpa George started the company, he had fewer than 10 employees. Today, they've got almost 100. When they say employees, family and family employees, that's what John is. He's literally family. John Grabowski has worked with all three generations of the Cordes family. At 12 years old, he took a summer job washing buckets at Metropolitan. Today, he's the plant's lead engineer. It's like family. When you come to this business, everybody that's here, they feel like family to me. Everybody says hello to each other. It's a good camaraderie. Everybody likes each other. It's more than just bread and butter for the employees. 
It's really nice being run by a family owned business. It, you can come to work and feel like you're at home. It's like a second family to me. We all work together, we, you know, we get down in the dirt, you know, we exchange uh, all kinds of work habits and we learn from each other and we do the best we can. The longtime employees are proud, keeping Detroit's Coney tradition going strong. We all grew up eating Coney's, right? Comerica Park, you know, baseball games as a kid with mom and dad and grandparents, family time. Coney dogs go, that's a part of pretty much everybody's childhood. It's a joy to be a part of that heritage. Today, Metropolitan's running six days a week, 20 hours a day. The amount of product that we're sending out each day, from the first dough that's kicking out around 1.30 in the morning till the final package at 10 at night, I feel constant pride. As for the future, George's kids seem to have inherited his love for the bakery. My daughters, Cecile and Sloan, I, I bring them almost every Saturday. They actually tell me that they enjoy it more than Disney World. And this is their favorite place on earth. Just like what it was for me as a kid that age. It's that joy and a family legacy that George hopes will carry on for many years to come. I absolutely love what we're doing here. I love our history. I never want to be that third generation cliche. You know, I want to continue the growth with my kids, or my kids' kids, have them look back, family members, and say, wow, that's incredible. Look at what you've done. Chili, mustard, onion. What happens if you reverse it? <laughs> oh, you're out. You're out. You're out. You're out. <laughs> Minutes from downtown is Detroit's Brush Park neighborhood. Folks here are flocking to enjoy the good vibes at this cool Coney spot. CMO may be relatively new to the game, but loyal fans can't get enough of their chili, mustard, and onions. CMO, get it? But unlike most diners in town, here, the Coney, the sauce, and everything else on the menu is powered by plants. My name is Pete Lacombe. I'm the owner of Chili Mustard Onions in Detroit, Michigan. You could say opening a vegan Coney spot in the Coney capital takes guts and grit. And that's exactly what this family's made of. I don't follow any rules. I follow the important ones, but I don't do what everybody else does. Pete and his wife, Shelly, along with their daughter, Darla, launching CMO in 2018. It's the first and only all vegan Coney spot in Detroit. I would say my wife gave me the biggest kick in the butt to go vegan, and we did. I had a vision that we were gonna open a vegan Coney Island, and I told Pete that, and he told me I was out of my mind. Pete and Shelly have enjoyed many a traditional Coney as lifelong Detroit residents. When Shelly and I got married, she used to tell me all the time that I was going to open a restaurant and it was going to be a vegan restaurant. And I said, yeah, I'm not vegan. So I asked her why she thought I was going to open a vegan restaurant. She said, you could never hurt an animal or sell animals. And I went, ah, oh, you're so right. 
Now, the family's been vegan for over 10 years. It not only saved my life going vegan and saved my life by doing something I love, um, I got to do something I love every single day with the people I love. Before entering the restaurant business, Pete worked in the auto industry, just like his dad and his granddad. When I was in automotive design, I ate horribly. I smoked cigarettes, I drank a lot. It was just kind of the norm in that field. That was really in my blood, but it wasn't in my soul. Cooking was in my soul. Pete's true passion coming from spending time with family in the kitchen. So we lived really close to my grandparents and what was in my soul was food. I cooked with my grandmas all the time. My grandma, my mom's mom, really should have opened a restaurant. And um, I feel like I'm living that dream through her. That dream now possible with the next generation. So Darla's our manager and she takes care of the customers so well. And seeing the woman that she has become, we're so proud of her. My wife and I, we've been through so much. We're partners in crime, partners in life, partners in love. And partners in creating a home away from home for every customer. I created CMO, the interior to reflect like my basement or my living room where you can come over and eat at my house. Everybody's welcome in my home. Every day, somebody wants to go tell him how fabulous this place is and how blown away they are with his food. Since it first opened, CMO has been delighting vegans and non-vegans alike with their take on hot dogs smothered in chili. The amount of love and emotion that is put into the food and every bite, you can tell that. I've never had vegan food, but it was really, really good. This just tasted so similar to the wood as a, a regular Coney Island. You know, it's hard to come by something that's like so close to like a childhood favorite. Of course, I had to see if this Coney truly lived up to the hype. Hey, Al. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Welcome to my kitchen. Well, this is really cool. We've heard all about this. When you're used to something that is meat, yeah. you know, getting them to try something that doesn't quite fit what they think it's supposed to be. For me, I let my food speak. If I put something out there on a plate that is incredible, happens to be vegan, that, that changes minds and hearts and, you know, it's incredible. I see your, your, your wife and your daughter standing out there. Are they taste testers? Oh, my wife for sure, yes. That's love. It is, oh, it's love. <laughs> and we'll be married 30 years this year. Congratulations. So. Thank you. Let's make some vegan magic. Let's do that. The, the hot dog, what kind of protein is this? It's a pea and soy protein. And this is your chili. What's yes. The, now, what's the protein in here? This is chili? Beyond uh, Crumble, uh -huh. a plain Beyond Crumble. A lot of Coney places are hush-hush about their chili, but Pete was willing to dish a little. How do you make your chili? I use a blend of spices, salt, pepper, garlic, onion, and a few other things that are top secret. <laughs> We're gonna throw that in our water. Okay. That's the hero right there. Right there. The spice is the hero. The chili's brought to a boil, then thickened with potato starch. It was time to try my first vegan coney. That's a healthy ladle. It is. I usually do a little more than that. Wow. So, yeah. Do a lot of onions. Here they are. Let's give that a shot. That's really good. Especially the chili. Thank you. How long did you have to work on the chili recipe? You know, I, I hit it right on the head when we first went vegan, mm -hmm. and then I didn't write it down. <laughs> <laughs> so then it took me about a year after that to really nail it down. But even with a winning recipe, times have been tough for CMO. What was the pandemic like for you guys? It hit us extremely hard, and we're still struggling and fighting, and you know, there's no quit in us, but it's been tough. Yeah. How's the future look for you? I really don't know. We're, we're trying, we're working every day, but I, I don't know what the future holds. I really don't. If it's based on the taste of that, your future's bright, my friend. Thank you so much. That I is good. It. Thanks so wow. much. Wow. The history behind Detroit's Coney Dog is truly an all-American tale, from the Greek immigrants who borrowed the name to a mashup of traditional flavors with a boardwalk staple. And now, there's a whole generation of locals who are ensuring that this regional hot dog is here to stay.
good Wednesday morning, and it begins with breaking news overnight. A high-speed train collision in Greece and a desperate search for survivors that's now underway. It's March 1st. This is Today. Head on, a fiery crash between a passenger and freight train north of Athens. More than 30 people killed.